Neither the name Zorin nor any other name or character in this podcast is meant to portray a real company or actual person. Welcome to episode 0014 of A Review to a Kill, our series about the James Bond franchise presented by FanboysAnonymous.com. It's finally here. A Review to a Kill has come around to a view to a kill. I'm your host, Dick Tracy, and you're still under arrest. <laughs> Obviously, you know by now I'm Tony Mango. I'm joined by Callum Wiggins. Come on, Tony, get a wig on. <laughs> and Robert DeFelice. The music tickles my Tchaikovsky. You must be taking a lot of vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, let's just remind everybody here, of course, to drop a comment below and tell us your thoughts on the movie and your thoughts on our thoughts on the movie and anything else that you want to chime in about. Because we love uh, seeing responses from whatever the people are processing these films, <laughs> the way that they are doing that. And if you're enjoying the series and you're thinking to yourself, brilliant, I'm almost speechless with admiration, then show us some love by hitting the like button on YouTube, share this on social media, make sure that you are subscribed, follow the channel, ring the little notification bell, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, take part of the Patreon and the join button on YouTube by you know tossing a little bit of spare change our way and donating to make sure that we do more of this stuff going forward because even a dollar a month is not only a bargain, it's also a way to help support us and to help us grow. So if you do love the content that we're bringing you on A Review to a Kill or the other things that are outside of A Review to a Kill, then that is the best way to make sure that you get more and more and more content. So let's uh, start things with the foreign language titles of this film, which I like doing here. And this is the one that has the most out of anyone that we've done so far, which I would think wouldn't be the case. Cause I would think that a view to a kill would be one of the more easy ones to translate correctly. Like, I would have thought that something like Octopussy would have had a lot more, but instead we've got tons of variations of kind of like, well, that's that's kind of the same thing, but twisted in a different way. Germany has In the Face of Death. A little bland, but you know, that's kind of what some of these are. The, uh, France has Dangerously Yours. I kind of like that title. That's good. Greece has James Bond Agent 007 Operation Moving Target. It's a mouthful. Spain a has A Panorama to Kill. <laughs> Just kill that panorama. Uh, Spain also has In the Sight of the Murderers. Sounds yeah. a little like... Uh, it's fairly accurate. A little harsh, though. Uh, Argentina has In the Sight of the Killers. Japan says The Beautiful Prey. I don't really know what that one's about. It's like yeah. referring to a specific character or whatever. Maybe Mede? I don't know. It's Bond. It's very <laughs> Belgium is boring as shit. It's dangerous mission. <laughs> Nobody does better the 14th time. Yeah. James Bond is now in dangerous mission. Last 13 times, they were fine. They weren't dangerous at all, you know. Israel has murder in the eyes. I like that. Sweden has living target. Kind of bland. Finland has 007 and the look of death. The look <laughs> of death. Of death. Is <laughs> Brazil has 007 at the aim of the killers. Shout out to my fiance. Portugal has the assassin's site. Bulgaria has view of death valley. So, bong. The Undertaker in there. Eventually face the Undertaker. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, it's Silicon Valley, not Death Valley. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they did Death Valley in there. <laughs> Shout out to the Undertaker and SmartGuyMoment.com. Go to check that out if you're into the pro wrestling stuff. Croatia has a look at murder. Which to me sounds a lot more like an Agatha Christie novel. Meeting you with a look at murder. <laughs> Czech Republic has the prospect of a murder. That sounds like a lawyer thing. You know? uh, if you check here in Exhibit A, there's a prospect of a murder that happened. And Denmark has Agent 007 in the firing line. Not a firing line in this movie. There are in other movies, so... Well, he shot at a lot. So he's yeah, in the line of fire. Any movie, though. In the line of fire would make a lot more sense. Yeah. Although, then there's other movies that would suit that better, too. So, Finland has 007 and the gaze of death. Now, that sounds very like pulp, that. 
kind of novel, you know, could even be like an alternate Star Wars title, Star Wars Episode Five: The Gaze of Death or something. Sounds um, more like um, Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah, yeah. For a very, for a very specific reason. 007 and the Eyes of Death and With Death in Sight are two titles from Norway. Romania has The Prospect of a Crime. That's even more Law and Order. <laughs> bum, bum, ba, dun, dun. The Prospect of a Crime. Slovenia has From Target to Death. Sweden <laughs> has Live Target. Uh, Ukraine has 007 Kind of Murder. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, what kind of murder is that? Yeah, it's a 007 kind of murder. China just went all nuts. Thunder killing. <laughs> and he strikes. Yeah. Like thunder killing. And my absolute favorite of every alternate title we've come across so far is the Hungarian title of this. He died. <laughs> <laughs> He died. Was it, was it 007 he died? Or no. Just he died? It's just he died. <laughs> Not even Agent 007 he died. And this isn't even one of the ones where they do some kind of a fake out death. <laughs> so <laughs> That's awesome. He died. <laughs> there are 14 films into this. They're like, I don't know. He, he fucking died. Who died? He. Shut up. Go watch the movie. <laughs> Did they just do that with an assumption of Roger Moore? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he, I, he died. No, that's like they, they made it thinking that it was going to be uh, Timothy Dalton already taking over and for like, oh, he must have, oh yeah, that guy died. We got yeah. guy <laughs> I'd love to just be around like the conference table of these Hungarian movie uh, title decision makers where they're all like, what do we call this one? And you're just like, I don't know. It's called A View to a Kill. Well, that doesn't translate all that well. What do we call like, well, this one's calling it Murder in the Eyes and this one's The Prospect of a killing or whatever i don't know he, he fucking died it's just <laughs> that's good enough it's so weird taglines for this are has james bond finally met his match nope and Spoiler. adventure above and beyond all other bonds y- yes and no yeah <laughs> he's in the sky at one point so yeah but he went into space so yeah that's true that's that it is now they're like this time He's on a horse for a little bit longer than the last time he was on a horse. <laughs> yeah. This time he's got longer hair, too. Michael G. Wilson's cameo in this is uh, just one of the least entertaining ones. He's just a voice that is overheard when Bond enters the city hall, which is like, nah, that's nothing special. We get closer to when we start. he starts doing things like, consider him slimed and everything. So one more bit of business before we get into the movie itself. Let's talk general scope. This is not my least favorite of the Roger Moore films, but it's Roger Moore's least favorite. He didn't like how, in his mind, it was more violent. Uh, The Zorin part where he shoots everyone, for instance, he had said, quote, It stopped being what they were all about. You didn't dwell on the blood and brain spewing all over the place. (laughs) I'm sorry, what? (laughs) What movie are you watching, dude? The blood and brains all over the place? It's not happening in this. Well, well he think, was. To be fair, Moore is a much older gentleman at this point, and he probably gets turned off very easily by everything. Not everything. Uh, Woman. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say Moore sees himself like the suave, sophisticated, like killer, and more about the quips and all the other stuff. So when he sees something that's that violent or harrowing in his eyes, then it feels like, okay, they're going in a, a direction that I'm not a fan of anymore. Yeah, I mean, he had said before that he didn't like the idea of kicking Locke off the cliff, and uh, I mean, we're all in agreement, it's not a good idea that he's just, like, slapping people around and everything, but uh, to me, blood and brains, don't show this dude license to kill, (laughs) he's not gonna like that. (laughs) Uh, He was also barely on speaking terms with Grace Jones. He said in one interview, my mother once said, if you have nothing good to say about someone, then say nothing at all. And it seems the reason why is because she tried to stay method the whole time. And because she was a villain, she was like, oh, so I shouldn't like him. And he took it personally. So he does not like this movie. Oh, yeah, this was it for him. This really rubbed him the wrong way. 
that combined with the idea that he's just too old for the part and they wanted he's to move in a different old. direction and everything too was just like you know what that's it I'm done and I I feel like this is one of those movies that I can watch it pretty easily it's a fun movie to watch but I know for a fact it's not one of the better ones <laughs> and it seems like we're all kind of in agreement it's like there's some good stuff here and there's some really terrible stuff in this movie too yeah. this there's something I told you guys what I wanted from this movie was just super 80s. And I feel like it gave me what I wanted from this film. So it's no going to be nowhere near the bottom, but it's not like it's not taking over the top spot. Now, I was saying to the guys earlier before we start recording that the only thing I can really say to describe this film overall is that it has some of the best stuff in the entire James Bond franchise and some of the worst stuff as well. And it's that mix of things, which means that it can't obviously go near the top for me, but I had more fun watching it than I would say was a bad time. I could easily go back and watch this movie multiple times going forward. It's, just, it's that kind of movie. We all have it basically exactly in our middle point. <laughs> I've got it number eight. Rob's got it number eight. Rob's got it. Uh, Callum's got it number seven, according to our current list. It might change by the time we're done talking about this, but... So you're going to hear some uh, some pros and some cons, and hopefully you enjoy the uh, the ride along there. So we're starting things off with the gun barrel, classic. A little bit understated and calm, maybe. That's the notes that I have written down, but nothing to really talk about. It's not like some super funky music or something. But I never liked the opening shot of the helicopter. It looks really fake. Yeah. It's just like... Uh, oh, there's a lot to go have a lot of that in this movie. <laughs> yeah, once again, you know. I'm pretty sure that there's not any kind of problems like that in the living daylights. I think that this might be the last movie that has like bad uh, rear yeah, projection bad, stuff. Where's well, bad green screen? This is the this is the movie where it became so glaringly obvious. I mean, obviously it was glaringly obvious in a lot of the other movies as well. If you know, if you look far, far enough, but you didn't have to really look that hard to see exactly what the stunt doubles all look like. Yeah, <laughs> in every scene that Roger Moore was doing, some well Bond was doing something actiony. Yeah, you know Roger Moore didn't be... do, I think, a single action scene is the the way that it worked out. It's going to be one of the Brosnan films where I just go off on why why have we returned to very poor CGI? Yeah, when we get to die another day, there's going to yeah. be a moment, one specific moment that'll be like, oh, God, oh, why? Just cut it. Don't do that, you know? But, Callan, you've been loving the skiing sequences. Were you happy to see that this was going to start off with one? I mean, there's only so many times you can go back to it. I'm still super impressed by all of the, the stunt skiers they can find. But mm-hmm. like, legitimately, I just don't know how they... They must just keep going to like the ultimate school of skiers or something along those lines. I don't know, I don't know where you find these people that can ski with like one leg and can just twist around in midair constantly all the time. But I'm glad they keep uh, get, giving work to these people. Willie Bogner, I think is the name of the guy that like he just kept uh, returning to help them do a lot of these things because he was just got, so good. Getting loaded pie checks. Yeah. So Bond looks through the pockets of a somewhat frostbitten corpse and finds a little locket necklace with a microchip inside of it. And right after that, he's spotted like immediately, and the action starts with this great action theme that I love throughout the movie. That. It's a part of the score that pops up quite a bit, and it's one of my favorite things about the movie. It's one of my favorite musical pieces in the entire series. It's this blaring trumpet of this ba da 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 da. I love that song so much. The music in this film is so good. Well, <laughs> stop you right there. Because not all of the music is yep. still Because <laughs> unfortunately, because... <laughs> that's where it turns into a different direction. So, so, so you know, you know, I've said constantly throughout this podcast, I don't listen to the not the music just happens in the background. Yeah. <laughs> it says something special about a piece of music where I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and that is when he steals the snowmobile. Or he, still, he steals the snowmobile and then he the snowmobile uh, crashes, like it's taken down by the helicopter. And so he gets a piece of it and uses that as a makeshift snowboard. And then California Girls starts playing. <laughs> yeah, California Girls by the Beach Boys. 
wish yeah, they sure. all could be California girls. It's just kind of like... I, I guess the idea was like, because it was snowboard, they told it, oh, it could be like a, surf, a surfboard because he's going to go across water with it. And it's just, mm-hmm. it really just doesn't fit in what's going on. What's even weirder about it is it goes from the one song to that back to the other song. So you've got this da 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 great action theme. I wish they all could be California girls. But da 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 And it's like, wait, wait a minute, why, why did you just do it for that little bit? You know? I don't hate it as much as the Tarzan yell, but it's in a similar boat to that. So I like I do like the beach boys. It doesn't fit here, but I guess they were trying to hint at, hey, we're gonna be in California for this one. Well, there's also just like, wouldn't it be funny because that's, you know, like we're just going to goof around. But it also, I don't know if this is a, something on their part, but there are a couple things that they do in this movie that they try to downplay Roger Moore's age. And the idea of Roger Moore at 57 being like a surfer <laughs> doesn't fit for me. <laughs> So Bond takes out a helicopter with a flare. I think that moment's kind of cool. And he climbs into this boat that's fashioned like a, an iceberg. And inside is Kimberly Jones. You wouldn't know it unless you looked it up because they don't say her name. But she's just a pretty blonde girl. She's working for MI6. And Bond's just sort of like, I got caviar and vodka. You want to fuck? So <laughs> five days to Alaska. What else are you going to do, right? And then bam, into the main theme. Because we get like a jump cut with that. A View to a Kill is awesome. Easily one of my favorites. It kicks so much fucking ass. It currently sits at the top of my ranking. And aside from one song later on in the series, that will definitely bump it off. The only one that even comes close is the next main theme we will hear. This song is fucking amazing. And it's been in my head for a month. (laughs) I loved Duran Duran. I loved this song. I loved every version of this song that appears in this film. Mm -hmm. Multiple versions. This this fucking song is just the best. Yeah, I can't really add too much onto the top of that. It's just an absolutely kick-ass song. The, The rhythm of it is so different to what we've seen in more recent movies where they've gone to a more romantic theme it's completely removed from that i guess it kind of really fits with the overall structure of the film in that regard as well and yeah it's just absolutely like that thumping the throughout all of it the yeah it's just a great tune i can't really say anything else beyond it it's just like it is something that's really great to listen to and uh morris bender got his wish he got to actually put the name of the film synced up with the lyrics this time <laughs> A view to a kill kind of thing. That's a neat little touch. I love the lyrics to it. It's like flowy and poetic, but at the same time, just sort of cool, you know? Uh, crystal tears fall of snowflakes on your body kind of stuff. Like, it's kind of a, you know, romance novel kind of flowy nonsense, <laughs> but I like that in this series. It's It adds such a different element to this film. <clears throat> It makes it feel like it's right at home in 85. It was just so much fun. The the visuals itself of the women dancing and having the neon glow on, it was just so 80s. And again, it was everything I wanted from this opening. And it delivered for me in every way. Thumbs all the way up. You got some... Uh women dancing into the fire during the part where it's, you know, dance into the fire and some skiing, no horses, no dancing Christopher Walken either. Although weapon of choice is pretty cool. The, uh, they managed to get this gig Duran Duran when the bassist John Taylor went up to Cubby Broccoli at a party, pissed drunk and said, Hey, when are you going to get someone decent to do one of your themes? (laughs) Respect. So then Cubby Rocky is like, all right, you do it then. <laughs> and it ends up being one of the best. It uh it reached number one on the US Billboard Hot 100, and it's the only Bond theme still to this date to do that. It was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Original Song. I have no idea what it lost to. I didn't bother looking that up. 
but they they wanted to appeal to the MTV generation, as they said, and it worked. Yeah, and they did it because <laughs> yeah. this song is fucking great. Any other thoughts okay. you guys have before we move uh, on? I mean, about, about the actual credits itself. I mean, the first shot you see in the credits of the opening credits is again this silhouetted woman taking off the yeah. top and the words 007 appear in in between her breasts yeah <laughs> so it's like okay we're watching a bond movie that's like, right. that's like the clear indication um <laughs> it's not like it's the most like sophisticated one they've ever put together but it has a nice effect with like it's a lot more animated lots it's a lot more actiony and active than the previous ones they've done you still have like a little bit of the silhouettes doing gymnastic stuff in the background you still have the little shots of Roger Moore jumping up from the uh I think they used the exact same one they used from For Your Eyes Only. Might be. Of him just jumping up and pointing his gun at the screen. I think that's uh, fair. But yeah, it's got like fire and ice motifs and I mean there's a lot of fire in the movie from this point on. This is basically we've we've seen the ice part now and they decided yeah. to continue it. <laughs> but uh yeah, it, I it's it's good. I can't say it's like super great, but it's like yeah, it, it does the job. Yeah, it's not my favorite actual visuals, but the song is just so friggin' good. And it currently stands uh, the top of my list and Rob's list, and number two for Callum, just underneath Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah, I mean, look, I had Goldfinger at the top because I said it's the blueprint for Bond films and Bond songs. This song is objectively good, and I listened to it. Since watching this film, I've listened to it at least twice a day. It's that good. We're in a range right now where there are a lot of things that are going to upset a lot of other things that we've gone through so far on my list. Like every theme going forward, except for one, I think um, nah, there's like two mainly aren't going to be like, they're all going to be close to the top. I love like the living daylights, license to kill golden eye tomorrow never dies, etc. So we're in that range where I'm not going to be any more like, well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, if you're only is okay, like that kind of thing. Do you, do you want to know the competition it was up against in the Golden Globes? But yes. what was it? Yeah. Yeah, just researching now. So the other nominees that didn't win, just like, I'm just looking at it, it's quite a stacked deck of things. You have Back to the Future's The Power of Love. Oh. Okay, that's that's awesome competition. Um, Mad Max Beyond the Fun and Dome, We Don't Need Another Hero. Oh. Uh, the Last Dragon's Rhythm of the Night. Hmm. And then the winner was from White Knight's Lionel Richie's Say You, Say Me. Oh. Well, 80s. Hard to beat, because that's that's a stacked list. Huh. I could see it losing, yeah. But, I mean, for my taste, it should have won. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably, out of those choices, I'd probably go Power of Love. Yeah, yeah, up there. yeah, that's hard to target against. It, wait, it didn't win that one. The Lionel Richie one, one. Yeah, the yeah. Lionel Richie one, one. Yeah, one, one. Say you, say me. Fortunately, that Simpsons thing ruined that song for me forever. Just hey, you, beer me. <laughs> so let's get into the plot here. Instead of Bond throwing his hat, he sees Money Penny's giant hat on the rack, and he almost tosses it, but she stops him. We're 14 movies into the series. They can play gags on tropes like that. So I like that they do that. And I'm pretty sure that it's the last time that we see uh, the hat gag in this yeah. whole series. Because hats go out of style and, you know, it's not a thing anymore. It's definitely the big case of Grandpa Bond and Grandma Money Penny. Very much so. Yeah. I mean, even just her outfit is like that type of like a material that you see older women tend to wear and everything because it's just more comfortable and whatever. But we get to meet a little robot dog named Snooper. <laughs> you know what? Uh, Money Penny has been great in all these films and she's a standout character. Money Penny's awesome and this is the last time that we'll see her. So we'll get back to that a little bit later. What, uh, what were you guys thinking when you first saw Snooper, the robot dog? <laughs> I, I thought it would be. I, I honestly thought it would be used in some fashion during the movie, and it kind of is, but really, really towards the end. So I thought it would have had a bigger role than it did. I can't say anything about it being particularly good. 
What about you, Rob? Weird, and I, I don't know. This this was a miss for me, just because it's one of those things that feels like, ah, oh, it's the 80s, this is the future, and it's one of the few things we still haven't actually gotten around to, Robot Dogs. Snooper is one of my downsides on the movie, because Bond doesn't even make any good enough dog jokes or anything. Like, you could have had a whole bunch. I'm sure it would have been easy. Or even if it would just would have been like, oh, good boy, or, you know, like some kind of a reference or whatever. It's, it doesn't do it for me. But here's also a nitpick of just how exposition is handled in movies in general. M tells Q to not bother explaining what a microchip is because they all know what it is. But immediately afterward, when they're talking about how they're susceptible to EMPs, Sir Frederick Gray, the defense minister, is like, magnetic pulse? What? Come on, defense minister. <laughs> We all know what these microchips are about, but what do they do? I don't know. Like, I don't like it when they do that in movies. We know that you have to explain things to the audience that isn't going to quite understand what an EMP is and everything, but I don't know. I think that there's better ways to do it than just one of the characters who's supposed to be one of the most intelligent people in the intelligence community just being like, what's an EMP? You're not briefed on that? Hmm. But we learned that the body that Bond took the microchip from in the beginning is actually 003. So much like how they killed off 009 and Octopussy, we've called off another 00 that we're seeing for the first time. So they just, they're like, screw it. And we're going to kill off more in the next movie. too. (laughs) I like the uh, the one. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you need that. You need uh, backup with 008. You're good. Everybody else, they're just fodder. They just die. We're going to kill at least two of them in the next one. And then uh, that's going to be a running gag is other ideas of other double O's being mentioned. I I like that when they switched over with Octopussy that they were like, let's actually use other double O's because we've got at least 10 of them, essentially. Although they've had instances in the past in like the books and stuff where there's like a double O 12 and all that. So these microchips are manufactured by Zorin Industries and there are duplicates to ones that are better equipped at handling the EMPs and everything. And basically what they got going on here is they wanted to make Goldfinger again. They did Diamonds and Diamonds Are Forever, and they said, hey, it's the 80s, baby. Let's go with microchips. That'll be the thing. Yeah. All right, maybe I'm a dumbass. I don't know. I mean, I am a dumbass, but we'll get to that. And why is the whole Zorin disclaimer at the start of this movie? That is because at the time there was like actually some kind of Silicon Valley person that was named something close to Zorin. I think it was like, it might've actually even been Z O R a N. Uh, there was somebody from that. And then there was like a fashion designer named Zorin or something. So they were just like, well, we don't want to run into any kind of issues. It's the only bond film that has this kind of disclaimer. And then they must've just realized that ah, fuck it. It's bond film. You know, who cares? Ah, it's I not know, like just... the, they were patterning uh, Christopher Walken after somebody named Zorin. They so were kind of patterning him off of some people, though. But it's just a massive coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. But is I it... liked it. This is very, again, very 80s. Computers are in. You know, we're going to see some really early use of computers just to determine who James Bond is, which I thought was hysterical. <laughs> Any other thoughts on the uh, office scene? Not particularly. I'm still not. I'm still not warming to this M just yet. Yeah, I like him, but he's got two more appearances yet, so to make an impression. But Bond and M and Q and Money Penny they go to a horse race to scope out Zorin, who they say is a French industrialist who speaks five languages without an accent, which is basically means to be like, ah, fucking Walken's weird. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty like, sure that's how accent. they did it. He said, like, without an accent, he, what he means is every single accent of every single dialect in human history. <laughs> that's so that yeah, the uh, Walken accent. To bring up that Simpsons thing again that I've brought up in the past, and just you know, because Simpsons is great, it's like that uh, thing with Mr. Burns where it's like, oh, so I'm perfectly healthy. No, you have every disease. They're just blocking each other. <laughs> he just goes, oh, t- today he's French, today he's whatever, and it's all combines into this weird bays of Christopher Walken's voice. I, I will say this. I, obviously, I know we'll talk a bit more about his overall character in general. I expected 
the accent to go a bit more all over the place than it actually did. This is before Walken becomes a character of himself. Right. Yeah, yeah kind of like... be a serious actor at this point. If you check out, like, old school Star Trek, which I don't really like, so I can't pinpoint any episodes or anything, uh, Shatner is not as bad. It's just sort of like, you know, oh, go over there. But eventually it's just like, hey, I'm William Shatner. I know what the, everybody wants to hear, that kind of thing. So Walken, same kind of thing. He goes from just being a little like, oh, you know, uh, Christopher Walken to being, you know, two mice uh, in a barrel <laughs> kind of shit. Like, you know who was offered the part of this before Walken, but turned it down? David Bowie. Oh, my God. <laughs> Imagine that. I don't want to. But Bowie's a great Bond. I think if it would have been Bowie, he would have been uh, in the opening credits, (laughs) like as the skier and such. He would have sang a song. Yeah, he He might have. Yeah, would have formed it, yeah. So that's an alternate reality I would like to see, just to compare it and see how weird that is. But he turned it down. He, He wasn't a fan of the Bond franchise. He had said something like he had seen one Connery film and he didn't like it or something. Not enough Muppets. Maybe that's why, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, they could have just replaced Snooper. So Zorn's there with his girl Friday and right-hand ma'am named Mayday. Cool name. Played by Grace Jones, wearing one of her signature outfits and make her, makes her stand out from a pack because that was, like, her main thing with this was, like, I gotta have these, like, wacky outfits and whatever. First Mayday. time seeing Mayday. Any thoughts? Mayday looks badass. Oh yeah, she just definitely, as she says, stands out from the crowd with that sort of attire and that look. Especially because they were going in the horse race in Great Britain. Like you wouldn't see, you wouldn't see many people. She would stand out from the crowd in that sort of uh, environment <laughs> for multiple reasons. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so they also meet up with as correct as I possibly can do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Oldman. <laughs> <laughs> In a different way. Uh, they meet up with Sir Godfrey Tibbet, played by Patrick McNee from the Avengers. The spy one, not the you know, Captain America and whatever. Um, the Avengers had Honor Blackman, who was Pussy Lure, and Diana Rigg, who was Tracy. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're talking about the old Avengers, not the other one that had Sean Connery and Ray Fiennes. So, yeah, <laughs> lots was, of yeah, Bond yeah. things going on here. Thurman. The terrible British accent. Oh god, yeah, we don't need to talk about Uma Thurman in that movie. That movie's garbage, by the way. Oh yeah, it's yeah, it's terrible. Ugh. Even back then when it came out in like ninety seven or ninety eight or whatever it was, where I don't have as much of an astute way to be able to criticize films, even then I'm just like, this is shit. <laughs> like this is not good. So. I watched a few clips from the um like the Avengers that you can find on YouTube and stuff like that. And it looks very, again, it's very of the time British humor, that sort of thing. But it looks like it's very, I don't understand. It's definitely not cool, but it's very, like, it looks like it's fun to watch. Probably at the time, it was probably awesome. I probably still would enjoy it because there's still a lot of fun you can get out of watching, like, 60s and 70s shows every now and again, as long as you're willing to, like, check your 2020 like uh, yeah. the way the world is brain and switch that off for a couple of uh, hours switch that off and also forget about things like if you're watching the old Adam West Batman you're like remember this isn't Batman <laughs> then you're like oh, okay he's doing the Batwatusi and whatever and it's it's yeah, different the only way to watch it so Patrick McNee by the way was actually the son of a racehorse trainer so pretty good casting there and I love that Bond doesn't pay any attention at all to what's going on in the race, but he wins because he bets on Zorin's race. Uh, horse, and he's just sort of like, hey, Money Penny, can you uh, cash this in for me? <laughs> Pegasus! <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, Tibbet also, he refers to M as Admiral, which I totally forgot about until I rewatched this again, even though I watched it a couple months ago, which furthers the theory that M might be Admiral Hargraves from The Spy Who Loved Me that I mentioned before. So... It's another little thing that can kind of get this conspiracy tinfoil hat going. But that's our introduce, uh, introduction, that's a word, introduction to the main villain, the main henchman, henchman, you should say. 
and I don't know. I don't think it's really the best introduction we've ever had, but it's good enough. The worst. Yeah, we've had a lot worse. And they, yeah, they look like fallen. exciting characters, or maybe that's just me because you know Christopher Walken. But they look like uh, this will be fun and a different take on Bond. Yeah, they look eccentric. Mm. They look like they're going to be a lot more fun to watch than when you get introduced to, like, Kamal Khan, for instance. <laughs> then we got to talk about the Eiffel Tower. That means oh, we're uh, we're in Egypt. So... Uh... <laughs> this This has to be... This has to rank up so high on the worst scenes in Bond history. It's up there. <laughs> There's a lot to hate uh, about this. And I'll say up to the point that... Well, actually, even past the point that uh, Mayday jumps off the Eiffel Tower and stuff like that. There's a, there is so much in the next 10 minutes or so <laughs> that is some of the worst shit that you will ever see in a Bond movie. Yep. First off, no reference to the fact that the owner of the Eiffel Tower is dead. No uh, tribute to Hugo Drax here, because remember, he bought it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But Bond meets up with this completely over-the-top French dude named Aubergine, who is a split second away from being like, oh, oh, oh baguette, croissant, Hercule Poirot, like, just kind of... So, he, there's been a history in the Bond franchise of some dubbing. Yeah. This has to be the worst dubbing job. And I said that, and then the movie continued, and then there was some that was actually at a level or even worse than this, but... Like, this was awful. Like, you could just see his mouth moving, and you kind of just tell, like, he's even not saying the words that are being said for him, or he's saying them so quietly or so, like, with no real pronunciation in his voice that they had to go really over the top with the dubbing to make it actually seem like, <laughs> okay, this is what this guy is actually saying. Should have just called Dickie Vanderzil. Would have been nice. <laughs> Wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense with his uh, stature and everything, but it would have been like, okay, well, she matches up with the dialogue at least. And there's this weird random thing called the Fabulous Dominique and the Enchanted Papillon. This hmm. performance where this woman's whistling and she's pretending that she can control these butterflies that are dangling from fishing rods. Who the fuck is enthralled with this? And it's a real thing, Frankly. too. The reason that they put it in the movie is because they had seen this act. And they were like, we should put that in the movie. It's yeah. stupid. Yeah, entertainment was still sometimes a light in the 1980s. It must have been, because they're just like, oh, look at that. She's, uh, she's whistling and the butterflies are moving, even though we can see the fucking strings. <laughs> oh, we'll talk about strings soon in a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's the butterflies are controlled by someone in one of those dark suits that you sometimes see in the back of like stage shows. Yeah, stage shows. Yeah, where yeah, well you have to just have some sort of object floating in midair or something like that, and they just play that role. And that person gets taken out in clear sight of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> no, one, no one back to Nile, lid. That's part of the act, you know. Ta- yeah, just taken out. The, the woman that's, uh, the Dominique is, like, who's controlling the butterflies kind of notices, but doesn't seem to stop performing still. And then, like, as Aubergine <laughs> is talking about how how great he's, uh, he's going to snoop out what's going on with this story and industries thing. He gets killed by a fucking butterfly, a sharp butterfly <laughs> flying into his face. Yeah. <laughs> One of the stupidest deaths in the entire series. This might be the worst death. But uh-huh. I can't think. I mean, I've watched a lot of it and I can't say I remember everything pinpointedly, but there are a few deaths that are worse than this. I think this one is right next to the, um, the fake uh, Blofeld running into the, uh, the mud bath, the goop. yeah, running into the mud bath. <laughs> this, this is silly. And what was the one liner that Bond delivered afterwards? Yeah, the fly in his soup. Yeah, oh, that's, that's right. Yeah, it's like, I, come on, come on. That's bad. I, I've literally wrote into my notes. This entire segment was a complete embarrassment. Yeah. I mean, Kananga's death is silly, but like this is just bad. And if Kananga's death could have been shot in a way that wasn't like, you know, a balloon, then it would be a gruesome death. But this is a butterfly gets jammed in the dude's face. And he's just like, oh, I'm French, I'm dead. Like, you know, kind of. And Bond goes after the assassin. It's Mayday. She jumps off the Eiffel Tower. She parachutes down. 
No, no, we need to talk about this a little bit because when they climb up the side of the tower, uh, Mayday uh, attacks him with the fishing pole. Oh yeah, he gets all tangled up. Yeah. No, but it's even worse than that because like you can see the stunt double going over, and you can see the actual support ropes holding him in place as he falls <laughs> over the side of the railing slightly. <laughs> There's like ropes tied to, I don't know whether it's like to his back or anything like that, but you can visibly see them in shot holding him in place. Like, oh, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm glad they're keeping the stuntmen safe by doing that stuff, but also to try and hide those things maybe a little bit. Yeah, it's not, it's not good. No. None of this is good. Not great. I mean, they had issues with the stunt because like stunt people were jumping off when they weren't supposed to and everything. And so that was a mess. And then we get a car sequence where Bond takes off uh, in this car that it's like a taxi or something. And this dude, of course, because you're, you know, you're in Paris. So you got to make it everybody know that you're immediately like super duper French. This dude's like, oh, my God. Ooh, like he's just kind of <laughs> no, so, no he's English. So <laughs> yeah. yeah he's, he's so unbelievably English that he's speaking English the entire time because obviously. <laughs> right. That's what they do. You can't actually you can't actually just have him speaking French and have subtitles on. Hmm. Because no one, no one reads. Nah. We're having speaking in French, and we get the point of it of it being like, "Dude, you're stealing my fucking car." <laughs> like, yeah, but it's oh my god! <laughs> it's like It'd be ma voiture, ma voiture. <laughs> I can speak a vague amount of French. So <laughs> I, I already did my extent of it. Baguette, croissant. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much it. Uh, Francais. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's about it I think that'll get you I'll get you a decent grade <laughs> Maybe uh, I took three years of Spanish instead And uh, I don't even retain much of that I can say my family eats in a window In Spanish if that counts Mi familia comen la ventana <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Half of Bond's car is taken off And he just keeps driving around in the other half I don't like this sequence <laughs> It well, ends with Money Penny, or not Money Penny. It'd be great if Money Penny just started you know, parachuting and shit. But you know, Mayday gets away on a boat, and you know Bond uh, ruins a wedding. Yeah, that, the, the second time that Roger Moore's Bond has ruined a wedding with a during chase sequence where he, where he um, fucked up the cake. <laughs> yeah, he jumps, jumps in, fucks up the cake, and uh, hands it to them, and it's like he sees Mayday getting away on a speedboat being driven by. Uh, Zorin, and he's taken away by angry chefs. Yeah, with a fucking meat cleaver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, th yeah, this whole thing is just awful. This entire it's bad. Is just not good. Let me get into a whole lot of horse stuff. There's a lot of horse related things in this film. You would have thought that they would have had more horse things during the uh, opening credits, but, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> my my note says... Horse auction part one, meeting a bunch of nobodies. <laughs> I forgot that I wrote that down. Bond and Tibbet head off to Zorin's estate. They're having this horse auction, and their cover is that Tibbet's the driver and the servant to Bond, who's going by the name James St. John Smith, or as he pronounced it, St. John Smythe. It's a good name. I just want to punch him in the face, though. It's <laughs> Come on. St. John Smythe. Like... If I met this dude, I'd be like, all right, fuck off. <laughs> you know? I think that's kind of the point. He needs to hang out with the right crowd. He's hanging out with that crowd. I know. It's just, I, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. It works. He's he's so douchey. And, uh, well, he was like that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, in a different way. With a different name. He always likes to do some of the James name, though. It works, because later on, he's James uh, Stock, I think is the name of it. We meet a couple of the henchmen. They are entirely forgettable. Like, I highly doubt at the end of the series when we're doing like a recap kind of thing, anybody's going to be like, yeah, man, remember Scarpine? <laughs> Everyone they introduce for a few minutes is entirely forgettable. Pan Ho, couldn't even tell you her name without looking it up, and I've seen the movie like a hundred times. Hmm. I do always remember Jenny Flex, though, who, by the way, was only 18 when she was doing this. So she's 18 and flirting around with a 57-year-old. A little bit weird. Yeah, that, that discussion about how um, she likes an early morning ride. Yeah, she uh, she says oh. that, and Bond says, oh, I'm an early riser, too. <laughs> yeah, it talks, talks about how she, he, he, she must love it in the saddle. It's like, <laughs> like, so she... The magic penis away. But... <laughs> she's memorable for a few reasons to me. Number one... Uh, she's hot. 
I mean, look up Allison Duty. Number two, the character's name stands out, Jenny Flex. Number three, the actress's name stands out because her name's Duty. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, why not? There's that good line there. Oh, by the way, Allison Duty, for anybody who doesn't know, she's mostly well known as uh, being in Indiana Jones. So. If you've seen uh if you've seen that, then you might go like, oh, it's that one. Yeah, okay. But there's also a part after this that I like, which is right after the whole early rise or early morning ride type of thing, where Tibbet is carrying the bags up the steps, and Bond says, Come along, Tibbet, stop wheezing. <laughs> what a fucking jerk. Yeah. And he continues to be at a jerk where he's like, Don't stand there panting. Start the unpacking. Here, I'll help. And he grabs an umbrella and that's it. I, I watching this, I'm like, oh, this is Tony's favorite thing because he's yeah. a bit of dick. It's great. <laughs> well, yeah, again, he's making out to be as a as a master would treat his servant. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I love the fact that they they spot the bug immediately in the room because every single hotel room that Bond stays in is bugged. Yeah, and, they're spying uh, on people for the bidding on the auction, which is cool. And they're playing a the, uh, tape recorder. In the um, and they play a tape recorder next to it, so it feels like oh, they're continuing the conversation where Bonnie's just verbally abusing <laughs> Tibbet, but they're actually just hanging out on the window, actually discussing what the next step is. Yeah, he's like making uh, all these references to like, oh, you didn't pack my clothes well and everything like that. And Tibbet asks, are, are they gonna have to keep up all this berating? And Bond's like, yeah, man, you know, that's the key to a successful cover, <laughs> dick. And they see uh, the main Bond girl of the film. Stacey Sutton, she's played by the beautiful Tanya Roberts, one of the former Charlie's Angels, who unfortunately passed away in January just when we were starting this series. And Bond says she bears some closer inspection. Bond's, uh, Tibbet's like, you know, we're on a mission. And Bond's like, hey, on a mission, I'm expected to sacrifice myself. <laughs> ah, magic penis. <laughs> it's just like, uh, you know, those little dowels that people have to try to find water. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it's working with him. So the party starts. Bond puts on these awful sunglasses. Horrendously huge and brown, and they're supposed to be like X-ray specs, but Jesus, they aren't even trying to make any of this subtle. He's basically wearing goggles and staring into a window. I hate the glasses. Yeah, I think he's kind of uh, representing that from the um, Elton John school of uh, spying. <laughs> yep. And he's got another gadget too where he copies a check that Zorin wrote out to Stacy. Not going to be up high up on that list of like, all right, now we've watched uh, 24 of these films. Let's talk about our favorite Bond gadgets. Remember that checkbook copier? But useful. it works. It you did know. the job. What about the um, uh, taking a photograph with his ring? What does that stand? Now that one I like. The little yeah. the little ring camera is cool. It's a little bit uh, obvious that it's just <laughs> whatever. They'd be like, "What are you doing?" You know? No, nothing. It's... I'm an old man. I make these noises. Yeah, it's my hip. <laughs> <laughs> but he meets up with two of the other villains in the movie, uh, Doctor Carl Mortner, who is. Uh, we get some hints that he's a Nazi because he is. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's actually modeled after Joseph Mengele. And we also meet Bob Conley. He's in the oil business. Chomping on, you know, a cigar. He's, he's Bob Conley, everybody. You know. Uh I I don't like Bob Conley all that much, but I like the part in a sense where it's like, yeah, of course, this would be some kind of oil tycoon that's just like, yeah, I'm gonna make some more money here with this fucking Zoran guy. Like, you know. But another guy that if I met him, I'd be like, I want to punch him in the fucking face. <laughs> this guy, you know. But is he more punchable than uh, J.W. Pepper? No. <laughs> <laughs> Pepper's much worse. Uh, these Democrats may, Bill. Bond also gets to talk to Zorin, and he has one of the lines that has stuck with me forever in this franchise. I'm happiest in the saddle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is the real like moment of um of real walkinism right there. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. I so guarantee good. it if I were Roger Moore, I would not be able to make it through the first take of that without laughing. Because if it was that if he just hits me with that, I'd be like, what? <laughs> like 
<laughs> I like to think that that was what happened in the first take of it, and so walking just got progressively more and more walking. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm happiest in the saddle. Yeah. <laughs> just to, like to put the spores in a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I feel pretty. Oh, so pretty. Oh, so pretty. <laughs> just gonna... uh... This bum movie needs more cowbell. Yeah. <laughs> I took the saddle and I hit it in the only place I could. My ass. <laughs> <laughs> the saddle is a weapon. Yeah. Choice. Zavon grabs some champagne and he heads over to Stacy. And man, I do not like the whole schmoozing that, that he puts on here. The whole act comes off super creepy instead of charming. She doesn't sound like she's being flirtatious. She's like annoyed. Like, get the fuck away from me, old crazy old man. It doesn't work for me at all. And it might be because Roger Moore was older than Tanya Roberts' mother. In his own words, he said, Well, the leading ladies were young enough to be my granddaughter, and it becomes disgusting. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, as long as... I have so much respect for Moore. He's, he he's like great. He yeah. Because it is just weird. He's all just like, oh, I was hoping that we would spend the evening together. And it's like, uh, so what? She could, like, tuck you in? Like, yeah. It's in the evening together. That's, uh, that's about 5.30 for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we gonna, he's going to fall asleep on the couch watching Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These things yeah, just the, happen when you get older. Get the early bird special, put my teeth away in the uh, in the in the glass, and then we'll just <laughs> Yeah. I was hoping night. we could spend the night together. I would tell you a whole lot of stories about this old person that I met in this one time and we used to eat peach cobbler at the on the bay and it used to cost a nickel and like you know, okay. <laughs> And Stacy's like, I'm like twenty two or something, like I am hot and young and Charlie's angel. <laughs> Uh, what do you think about Tracy? Or Tr- Stacy, not Tracy. Oh, Tracy's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you think about Tracy? Let's go back to uh, Circuit Service. I, w- I wish we could. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, she is... Okay, so we find out later in the movie that she's a geologist. <laughs> and she's like the state... She's hired by the state to be the like state geologist. So have you heard the phrase dumb as a rock? <laughs> yeah. She kind of takes that to heart, really. She's, yeah. fair, she's not she's not the dumbest thing in the world. It's just that it she's up there. the accent and the constant shouting of James throughout the rest of the movie, but mm. she, I, I like, she's not my, she's not my favourite and she will be pretty low down. But she's not as useless as some of the other Bond girls are, at least in my opinion. Tiffany's still up there on the useless scale. Uh, she was fine. It, there's a huge disconnect, but we've already touched on it in several ways. Is she on the pure hotness scale that we've been saying we're going to rank the Bond girls on just attractiveness, and we're also going to rank them based off of overall characters? Tanya Roberts I mean, yeah, is Tanya Roberts. smoking hot. Like, she is not my favorite of the Bond girls at this point, and she's, you know, there's going to be others that I'm going to rank higher than her, too, but Tanya Roberts is a beautiful woman. She is, I mean, she's a Charlie's Angel. She's hot. But she also carries with her this valley girl type of thing, and it's just not believable in a lot of ways because, yeah, beautiful women can be geologists and, you know, whatever. Like, it's, I've come across a beautiful woman in practically every different type of range of just being like oh yeah this one's a lawyer this one's you know whatever that's not a a detractor but the way that she delivers the lines it doesn't make me believe that she's one of them and we're gonna get another character later on in the series that is exactly the same as that it's uh denise richards in the world's not enough yeah so Uh, yeah i knew that one was becoming as well so she she kind of fits the mold in that regard yeah, she, as far as like a pure overall ranking, that's not just taking into the fact uh, attractiveness, but the characters in general, she is my current number 33. Like she's below Sylvia Trench. She, she's below Miss Taro from Dr. No. I'm not a fan of the Stacy character. I and, currently have her. Yeah, let's see what you have for 
Again, if you get rid, a lot of, higher. Um, if, yeah, if you get rid of Money Penny again, because it's just like the the general one, she's uh, I think eighteenth for me. I haven't started ranking the women, but when I do, she's not going to be very high. You've uh, Callum's got her in between uh, Kissy Suzuki and Tiffany Case. I think she's more useful than Tiffany Case proved to be. In I movie. mean, well, yeah, no, I she mean, she'd be at the if we were ranking them on pure usefulness, she would be at the bottom of every list. She was awful. See, I got Tiffany higher up because the first half of the film, Tiffany is fantastic. Yeah, but that makes it worse. And then the last yeah, half of the film, she's absolutely terrible. Bit. Like we did, we didn't see it. We didn't see the scene in the movie where she hit her head and just lost all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. function properly. <laughs> no, but you saw the part where she got seduced with the magic penis. And there it yeah. goes. Ooh, we saw that part too. <laughs> so Tibbet and Bond do some sleuthing around the stables, and they confirm that Zorin's been giving his horse steroids that he activates with a little trigger in his cane during the races using the microchips. And they fight some goons, and the goons are purposely cast to be older to try to make Roger Moore not look as old and they give him like a, tr- a track suit that he's wearing to try to be like look he's he's wearing you know the thing the kids are wearing these days he's hip it's, secret agent man like yeah he gets it That's yeah great. it's it's not good Tibbet's completely useless in this scene too he even acknowledges oh, okay. it <laughs> he's just a bag boy isn't he <laughs> yeah he's uh he's uh, an agent of some kind no but he's, he's not double o but you know he's keeping up the gimmick <laughs> This, this is again. It's it's just one of the worst fight scenes in the entire franchise so far. Mm-hmm. It's just like Bond can't really do that much at this point in time when you have to see Roger Moore doing this stuff, and then they get thrown onto a packing machine and trapped in boxes. I do like his line of "Don't worry, it's all wrapped up," <laughs> and the guy's getting boxed yeah, up. Still, still, uh, it's not for me. They do have to follow it up with a guy seeing that guy in there and it's the whole like the hands popping out or whatever that's a little bit past that point and they even acknowledge it later on they're like oh well once those people wake up or whatever they're gonna identify us and and all that so this you shouldn't have as much afterward to get to that point but there is because we have to go into Zorin and Mayday having a sparring session and this is weird isn't it (laughs) it's a little creepy yeah yeah like, this looks like something that would happen in, again, in a really creepy version of Glow. <laughs> so the editor. Um, Good job. I mean, to be fair, I don't think they'd go this far. And yeah, well, I said they'd go this far. They would have. Well, Zorin would probably knock her out probably at some point in that in that regard. But uh, and there would be a fake pregnancy or something along those lines. But actually, but in this one, it's just like him. Well, she she's holding her own against him because she's like built to be freakishly strong. But Zorin gets the better of her, and then he's just holding her down, and then he starts making out of her, and it seems like that's weird. But that well, I, no, guess, but... I guess I guess each their own. Like if you if you get off on that sort of thing and it's consensual, then it's fine. Yeah, because she calls him my love, but she also tries to bite him. So like, it seems like she knew what was coming, and it seems mm-hmm. like like this is just their regular routine. Yeah, this is full play for them. Yeah. Yeah. Although she acts kind of pissed afterward. Well, and I, pissed the, I'm assuming it's because she's like, yeah, yeah. yeah it's she gets all the way. I'm assuming it's that and maybe a little bit of damn it. He beat me mm. kind of a thing. Cause you know, yeah, I mean, he had a, p- a pin instead. Right. But the whole idea of like, she's like trying to bite him and everything. It's just, it's, it's just well, weird. As we, found, as we found out very soon later, she likes being on top. So. That's true. Cause Zorin and Mayday go to see if Bond's in his room and he's not but he managed to sneak in Mayday's room to get in her bed and say, I've been waiting for you to take care of me personally because of their whole little meet up earlier where she's like, somebody will take care of you. Oh, you'll see to that, whatever. And we get this, (laughs) we get this weird jump cut where she gets into the bed. I have no idea why they did that with the editing. Did you notice that? that? Yeah, that was very strange. Mm. So they, they're gonna fuck, uh, and she gets on top or whatever, and a little funny tidbit of information, Grace Jones apparently had a giant black dildo in the bed with them when they were filming this scene. <laughs> <Hell>. <laughs> Wonder why Roger Moore didn't really like her, right? 
<laughs> well, how far before they gotta go? I mean, I think that that was her idea of just being like, he's gonna come across this and be like, what the fuck? <laughs> what are we doing here? Method acting, but wow. Yeah, well, you know, Grace Jones, everybody. <laughs> so we got to talk a little bit about Grace Jones and Money Penny. Uh, Money Penny. I keep wanting to call her Money Penny. She would be a weird Money Penny, wouldn't that be the case? Mm. Uh, she was a huge deal at the time. You know, she's like a fashion designer and model and, you know, all these, like, you you start listing, you know, kind of like you get like Madonna and it's like, well, you're, you're uh, an actress and a singer and a whatever. And you just go down the list of like artistic type stuff. Grace Jones is an anomaly. She's a weird individual and she seems like incredibly self-actualized where she's just like, this is me. Fuck it. Deal with it. Kind of like, I kind of admire, uh, admire her for that. Yeah. She's like equal parts intimidating and hot. <laughs> it's Yeah. That's, and that's definitely the vibes the character gives off as well. Like I can see it being like, Oh yeah. Like uh, one of the bond girls, like look at this, uh, this model and whatever. And at the same time, it's like, well, she's on par with like odd job. <laughs> you know? Mm. There's odd job and Jaws and Mayday. And at the same time, it's like, is she the is she kind of one of the best looking ones in the movie? And like, you know, it's just Yeah. It, it's weird. And I, I love Mayday. She's one of my absolute favorite parts about this movie. And for that matter, one of my favorite characters in the series. Yeah, she's great. I uh, got no problem with her. I don't think that like her pronunciation and actual speaking parts are that impressive. Yeah. Oh, she's not like she, a, an actress. She's actress. not an actress. <laughs> yeah, she's, not, she's not an actress. But the look, the vibe, the just the general presence that she gives is one of the most impressive of any like hench, henchman or henchwoman that uh, we've seen in the entire franchise so far. Major thumbs up on Mayday. So Dr. Mortner realizes that one of the vials of the steroids has been moved and put back in the wrong place. So they know for sure Bond is up to something. And when Zoran meets up with Bond a little bit later, he's like, uh, you slept well? And Bond says, a little restless, but I got off eventually. <laughs> I love it. It's a great line. How dated is this swanky, indispensable computer? I can't live without a computer. Yeah, a computer <laughs> is yeah, indispensable. Yeah. Zoran uses this thing, and it's it's got even the beeps and the boops and everything, you know? I love his reactions when he's looking at the screen and he sees that Bond is licensed to kill and a secret agent and whatever, and he's just, like, laughing because Zoran's a fucking madman. He's a psychopath. Yeah, as we establish later on. But he just invites him casually to this afternoon ride. He's just like, yeah, you know, I'm going to ride some horses. You want to come? And Tibbet, by the way, is sent into town to send a message to M about this. And for his cover, after he's washing his car, Bond tells him, tell him that you're getting the car washed. So Tibbet just tosses the dirty water back onto it. <laughs> I like that a little bit. Tibbet would probably try to kill Bond. Like uh, old M. <laughs> And Tibby gets killed in the car wash. What are your thoughts about that whole sequence? I love, I love the shot of it. I think the shot, the camera angle I get of it is really good because you, you know that someone's in the car and you assume that it's obviously Mayday, but the way that it's shot is like it's a little silhouette. And before, like he gets caught, like something wraps around his neck just as the, the, uh, the top part of the car wash is coming down. I think it's really well shot. Mm -hmm. I yeah, was like that. that. Was really well shot. Good scene. I felt bad because I liked him. Yeah, but, it's cool. Yeah, it wouldn't be a Bond movie without some of the allies just dying. Yeah, multiple ones in this movie. So Tibbet's gone, and uh, Zorin has set Bond up on this track that has these moving hurdles and these other jockeys that are smacking Bond and all. The idea in mind being, if you win the race, then you can get that horse for free, and you know if you can survive, kind of a thing. But Bond, of course, overcomes like all the obstacles because he's Bond, and 
things get a little bit weirder when Zorin activates the booster and Inferno, the horse, and Bond gets off the track right toward the car, but Tibbet's dead and he's replaced by Mayday, so the jig is up. And uh, uh. it's like, okay, well, I know that you're 007. I know that, you know, you're coming after me for this kind of thing. He says that killing uh, Tibbet was a mistake and he's like, oh, I'm going to make another one. <laughs> I'm going to fucking kill you too. So Mayday pushes the car into a lake or some body of water, or river or whatever. And Bond's able to escape drowning by sucking on the air from the tires of the car, which they tested in Mythbusters. Totally impossible. As expected. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but Bond owns space, so fuck you. <laughs> right, yeah. You know what I love about this entire sequence? Is that Zorin and Mayday try and kill Bond immediately. Yeah. <laughs> they don't yeah, mess around. I mean, it's like they don't just shoot him in black, in like broad daylight. Like they just have him knocked out in the back of the car, and they decide to dispose of the already dead uh, Tibbet and Bond, who's been knocked out in the back and drowned them in the water. So they're basically lost completely. And he just does tries to do that immediately. He doesn't. Obviously, he does a few sequences later on, revert back to more of the the Bond villain type. But I just like the fact that like, yeah, he just wants to kill this guy. Get him out of the way. And yeah. uh, he hits something like, uh, you know, if I don't report or so like that, the type of thing with like 008 of, you know, if I don't report, they're going to send somebody else after me or whatever. And he says, like, well, if you're their best guy, then I'm pretty sure that they're going to just want to cover their tracks because you're an embarrassment. You suck. Adios. And I'm guessing maybe you'll be able to tell us, Tony, because you listen to the commentary. It's been 20 years. Somebody in the 80s must have been like, Fuck that. Let's kill this fucking guy. Why does everybody always have to monologue? Nobody brought it up on the commentaries or anything. So I don't know if that was like a direct choice or if it just kind of worked out that way. But yeah, like you shouldn't monologue. <laughs> you know, Incredibles teaches that lesson too. Good movie. No capes. So General Golgol is back. He meets up with Zorin and chastises him for not getting approval before killing Bond because he's just like, you remember how he was in For Your Eyes Only? He's like, ah, this guy. I fucking love this guy. All right. You know, <laughs> Gogol's great. I fucking love Gogol. And Zorin no longer considers himself a KGB agent. They have the whole line of, you know, nobody leaves the KGB. And this one dude's super pissed about that. He's just like, you know, if you weren't, if it weren't for our training, you would just be a biological experiment. So they have this sort of angle going on where Zorin is like a super soldier. But I honestly don't feel like it ever really comes up or is exhibited because immediately afterward, Mayday is the one that picks up the dude. So if anybody was experimented on to become the next Captain America or whatever, you know, Captain USR or whatever, USSR, it would be her, not Zorin. So I think the explanation they give is like later on in the movie when a uh, bomb meets with Lee is the idea that so uh, the doctor mm -hmm. Mortner name is off to me. Yeah, Mortner is um essentially he was the one that created this in the concentration camps uh, gave pregnant women injections with steroids in them in order to the idea to breed this race of super babies but it's the idea that these babies would be heralded for their intelligence rather than their strength so that's what the steroids were there to do. And so the ones that did survive turned out to be super intelligent, but the side effect was that they were born psychotic. Right. So he's not... I mean, obviously we see him training, so he's he's capable, but he's not like an Strong. Amazon warrior like uh, Mayday is. Uh, he's just... He's super intelligent. That's his... That's what the steroids has given him, as well as being cuckoo bananas. <laughs> do you guys recognize the other bodyguard? No. Dolph Lundgren. Not. Wow. Makes I, did sense. Not, I did not say that. This is his first role. Sense. He has no lines. And he was in the part because he was dating Grace Jones at the time. So, like, Dive right, right after this is Rocky IV, too. I think it's like the next year or something is Rocky what? IV. I mean, would you not just be genuinely, like, of course, Miss Jones, whatever, whatever you want. I mean, you look at a guy like Dolph Lundgren, and he's a handsome jacked dude i would have been like he should be a villain in this you know like yeah it would have worked 
So that's just one of those things where it's a, you know, trivia night at some point, if you want to try to stump somebody, it'd be like, you know, which one of the following people was in a Bond film and name a couple people in Dolph Lundgren. Most people would be like, no, nah, okay, Dolph Lundgren wasn't in. He would have been one of the henchmen or whatever. And it's like, no, he's in there. He's just some bodyguard in one scene of a view to a kill with no lines. Just the dude. The Zorn's got a conference meeting. His proposal is to take out Silicon Valley so they have control over the microchip market. And everybody there is going to be an investor of $100 million plus half their market income. So some of them are like, what the fuck? You, you crazy? And in a much better variation of Goldfinger, where instead of it being, I'm going to explain my plot, and then you're going to either agree or disagree, but I'm going to take one person and kill them, and then I'm going to kill you all anyway, <laughs> which makes no sense at all. One dude speaks up. He's not down for that. So Mayday leads him out, and whoops. He falls out of a blimp and we see him fall into the water. Not like the OHMSS type of thing, but it's where it says, does anybody else want to drop out? That's a great line, but we get a bad line immediately after that, which is, wow, what a view to a kill. Who talks like yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it gave us a good song, so fuck it. <laughs> Well, originally it's from a view to a kill, but they dropped the from because it's just, you know, it's wordy. Meeting you from a view. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's like the original name from the, uh, the Fleming oh, from thing. The story. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not its own book. It was a short story or something. But this line, wow, what a view to a kill. The Swedish and Finnish VHS releases subtitled it wrong <laughs> and they replaced it with, Wow, what a view. Tokyo. <laughs> Live and let die. No, wait, that's not. That's, Just uh... Tokyo? What? This isn't close to Tokyo. What the fuck? You... I love that. Uh, when I came across that little bit, I was just like, huh? <laughs> I love it they did that in the, in the movie, and then um, like he says, uh, what? Uh, well, what have you, Tokyo? And then you only live by. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, remember it's uh, 007 in Death Valley too, <laughs> so they're just. Yeah. <laughs> so then we get off to San Francisco, and Bond meets up with a replacement ally. Now that Tibbet's dead, and it's a CIA agent. So you're thinking, no, oh, yeah, maybe Felix Leiter, but no, they're still not using Felix. Instead, it's Chuck Lee. And during the Fisherman's Wharf scene, one of the extras in the background is Maude Adams, the one who was Andrea Anders in Man with the Golden Gun, and she was Octopussy. So she's the only woman in the entire series to play three different parts, minus Nikki Vanderzil, technically. That's cool. good. And she's just like woman in background. They just kind of invited her on, and they were like, why don't you just like yeah, pop up in the shot real quick? A woman. <laughs> A woman on Fisherman's Wharf. And Chuck Lee explains a little bit more. Callum mentioned this earlier. Dr. Mortner was a German scientist. He did the whole steroid thing that explains the horses. So they got this like surrogate father son relationship in a way, which I like. Something different. Yeah. So this guy's a Nazi. Yeah. Full blown Nazi. Yeah. It's kind of a kind of one of the darker timelines in the Bond series. Though. Nazi like working for the Soviets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's just kind of doubling up on the uh, bad guy formula here. Evil. He's just, he's just bad. There's going to be something in the next movie that'll be like... Well, I won't spoil it, but I'll say in any other time frame other than that, if you say these characters are in it, you're like, oh, they're, they're the villains. <laughs> and they're not in the next movie. So, yeah, at least when it comes to the German side of things... Once we got past that uh, World War stuff, it's always been like the German. Oh, they're probably the villains, right? Nazis? Nazis were a thing, you know? So, <laughs> acknowledging Nazis in this. Uh, I think the only other time they might have acknowledged Nazis was Goldfinger with the uh, the gold. It was like Nazi gold or something. But we get a little SoCal Valve action. If anybody gets the joke, <laughs> then <laughs> you're a fan of pro wrestling. So check out Smart Out Moment. Jesus Christ. <laughs> How could I not? It's a valve in Southern California. I mean, come on. Fair enough. Uh, 
but Bond is checking a pumping station, and that's not a euphemism. And I like this bit where Zorin pulls this Russian dude out of the water, and they, he captures that guy instead of Bond, and they put him in one of the tubes, and he gets <gasps> shredded up by blades of the fan. Yeah, but, that was, that's that might be something that Moore had a bit of exception to. That I get, yeah. But I really love how you see the pressure gauge struggle a little bit before it goes back to climbing. So it's like subtly showing that he's been diced up enough that it's not interfering anymore. That's cool. Oh yeah, it's great. I think it's an like this guy. This guy Zorin is just an absolute again psychopath and killing machine essentially. And obviously not. He does let other people do his bidding for him, but he doesn't wince at any thought of the idea of doing this to people. Mm, just like yeah, put him in the tube, fucking kill him. I just like, yeah. I just love, love the fact that there's this giant coincidence that Bond goes to spy on this place at the same time two Russians are also spying on the place as well and trying to blow it up. Yeah, he's lucky. <laughs> so do you like that type of villain? Like this brutal killer, just, yeah, yeah, put him in the tube and dice him up kind of a thing. How do you guys feel about that? Because it's, it's kind of a departure. Well, so what, I, I, I think it's worth being in the market for these sort of villains every now and again. Like, I like the fact that you have the more sophisticated, calm and collected killer like a Scaramanga or something like that. But they obviously have a good place in the Bond franchise. But I think that every now and again, you should just have a complete psychopath that just wants to kill. Obviously, he has a reason for it. And he has motivation behind it about taking out Silicon Valley and just gaining a monopoly over microchip production. But the fact that he just was willing to just kill whoever to get it done. I think as long as it's played well, you can definitely have a Bond villain like that. Yeah, I think it's one of the better villains, quite frankly. He's a lot of fun. I think Psychopath, to a point, when you no longer have Blofeld and you no longer have a definitive villain, you need a total fucking Psychopath for Bond to fight. Because at the end of the day, Bond's a psychopath too. I mean, he needs to look better by being less of a sociopath than this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like Batman's the crazy dude, but hey, he's fighting with the cops. <laughs> but like, yeah, like the Joker is a fucking psychopath, and so is Batman. But he he cares about people. So that's good to know because when we get around the license to kill, a lot of people are like, "This villain's too dark," and then it's like, "Because he's worse than Zorin." So. Um, so the Russian, one of the people that were going into that is a beautiful blonde agent named Pola Ivanova. She's, you know, Bond, James Bond kind of thing. Uh, originally she was going to be again, Anya from the spy who loved me and they didn't get that sorted out again. So that cameo for the second or third time, they were like, let's bring back triple X and just didn't work out. I mean, they could have uh, recast her. They could have. Yeah, they've recast plenty of other people. But I guess they just figured, you know what, we'll just make a new character. But and that would have been kind of cool, I think, to bring Anya back and kind of call reference to that. And this yeah. would have made a lot more sense like that. A lot better than the other idea of her sleeping with Global. And it would have been a lot better just to have any bit of continuity in these films is just such a gem and so appreciated, at least for me. But... I like the character here, I guess. I like Paula Ivanova. <laughs> so, essentially, what the, her entire run in this entire franchise, essentially, is they drive away in the car after she recognizes who Bond is. They share a hot tub, they make out, they have sex in a, sex in a hot tub, and then she leaves stealing a yeah. tape that she took of the recording of what was happening with... Um, Zorin and everybody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Zorin and everybody in there. And and that's basically it. In between that, she has <laughs> the worst Russian accent in human history. And she she asks uh, Bond, hey, you know, did you know that I was an agent when I had orders to seduce you and everything? And he's like, Well, why did you think I sent you three dozen red roses? And he puts on some music and she puts on the hot tub and she has a line that is great. The, the yeah, bubbles that, tickle yeah. my Tchaikovsky. <laughs> I immediately stopped what I was doing and messaged Tony that very line because what the fuck is this? 
I think it's hilarious. That's pretty funny. It's, it, well, it's absolutely hilarious. That's why I've been saying it for the last week. <laughs> <laughs> the bubbles tickle my Tchaikovsky. But see, so, so the Chiefs played by Fiona Fullerton, who was just like a, a somewhat, at the time, relatively famous, famous British actress at that time. She... I think she basically pretty much retires in the early 2000s, so you don't really see anything from her beyond that point. But so she was brought up in loads of different places. In my like little bit of research I did on her, but she's originally from Nigeria. Really? Ah. She was. Well, she was born in Nigeria. She had um, trying to see. So, um, so she she's the. Her, I think both her parents are British, I believe, but. They were just over so there. She was born, yeah. But, she, but yeah, they were out there at that point in time. So she was born in Nigeria, she then lived in Singapore and then Germany and then the United States and then went back to the UK afterwards. Hmm. So she, so she's well-travelled. She clearly never went to Russia <laughs> <laughs> based on this actual... Like this this accent is so... It's so thick in the way that... Uh, not thick, it's in, like stupid. Not like a... Um, uh, Two C's. I'm trying to think of it. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's not um but it's it's in the but it's thick in a way that nobody actually speaks like the accent, but you can tell that it's Russian. Yeah, you know, it's in kind of Soviet like, Russia. <laughs> you know, that yeah, kind of Yeah, yeah, because like if you put that accent on when you're trying to be Russian and then everyone that you'd actually talk to who's actually Russian doesn't sound like that because no one sounds like that. Yeah, like when somebody's doing their impression of an Australian person, and they're like, "Hi, hey, mate, you want to put another shrimp on the barbie?" And people are like, "Yeah, we're not doing that in Australia." <laughs> you know. But I just like the fact that like she she comes in, she does that thing. With, she's I was like, "Okay, I might as well. We got an out of that situation. My friend died, but like, I can just fuck on now and make myself feel better." And they get through that. I've got the tape now. I can just leave with that. Go see Google. Yeah, they hop into the car. <laughs> Google's there to be the driveway uh, guy. <laughs> like for B and M, he's he's getting in the in the thick of things, right? And I I need to point this out though as well because she gets into the car. Like we see a wide shot of her getting into the car. That guy in the car with her is not Google. <laughs> it's just some other random dude. And then you cut the camera cuts, and then you see Google. And I kind of I had to rewind to watch it because that's definitely not Google. And then it is Google. Uh, I guess Google couldn't drive. Or couldn't be there on scene on actual on actual yeah, like, on set at that point because then it just cuts away to a clear green screen of Google pretending to drive, and then they listen to the tape and then it's just a load of Japanese music. Yeah, it's the it's meditation music. Yeah. It's like fucking got her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a way, I'm like kind of happy that it wasn't Anya because Anya wouldn't be that stupid. Yeah. It's like ah, oh, you klutzy uh, Russian spy. Well, you never know. Once everybody eventually gets a little dumb in this franchise. I mean, Anya did go from being a very capable agent to somebody who's just hanging out in a bikini. So. That's true. Not quite as bad as Tiffany Case, but. Uh. So then, <laughs> the, my top note for the next part is Stacy and Fire Bullshit. <laughs> Bond spots Stacy, follows her to her mansion, and breaks in using this little credit card lockpick type of thing from Q Branch. It's a cool little gadget. I like that one. And Stacy dupes him, pretending that she's in the shower. But she's ready with this shotgun, and she thinks that he's one of Zoran's goons who cut her phone line. So he's like, oh, crap. The other goons attack, and Bond uses the shotgun. But to his surprise, it's loaded with rock salt, so it's effectively pointless other than a distraction and just to kind of, you know, ah, fuck, kind of a thing. And we get a fist fight sequence that's terrible. And it has one of the first of many times in this film that Stacy is basically standing there being useless other than to squeak and yell. And she eventually breaks this vase that has her granddad's ashes in it. Sorry, granddad, that kind of thing. I hate it. <laughs> not no, great. I, it's not great, but like, she, at least she, she helps. Like She does do something to help Bond. That's, I think, the only time in the movie that she pretty much does it, too. So it's like, that's no, her moment. Few, no, there are a few other things that she does in the movie. I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, like she is more active than some other Bond women have been. I will defend it when you say that she hasn't. 
I'll uh, I'll be sure to take that argument a little bit later. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, no, it's totally fine. I'm, I'm down for it, but I'm going to try and defend her a few, in a few places. She, so she, after this is the case, she's just like, you know, you want to eat something? I've got only leftovers and I'm a pathetic cook. And Bond's like, you know, well, I'll take care of that. So he makes quiche. And there's this other bimbo moment where she's like, oh, it sounds interesting. What is it? He just goes, it's an omelet. <laughs> This chick just had people break into her home and she broke her grandfather's ashes over one of the guys. And she's more concerned with getting changed into a sexy evening gown and eating some eggs with a 57 year old reporter who bro- also broke into her home mm. and snooped on her taking a shower. We'll try to. What? what? Sh- like, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so she reveals that the, her backstory is that Zorin bought her family's oil business. And the $5 million that he planned to give on her in a check was to buy her shares out. Apparently, they're like, that was about like 10 times, times more or something. Yeah. Worth, yeah. And then she hasn't cashed the check. And because now uh, Bond points out about the fact that, oh, he sent over his goons to try and intimidate you into doing it. She decides, OK, I don't need the money. And she rips it up instead. Yeah, she'd rather live in a tent before she gives up. Yeah. Not my favorite She's acting scene. Feisty. Like a good uh, grandfather that's yeah. in her ashes, Bond tucks her in rather than sleeps with her. Even though she's totally down to bone, she's giving him the fuck me eyes and everything. Yeah, that's the... I like that we, we've seen Bond kind of mature in so many to ways. To a degree. Yeah, yeah, we get again, he's, he's not sleeping with everybody. He's being selective now. I mean, it's got to be partially because he's like, well, her grandfather's in the ashes and he probably is my age. <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it could be around that, you know? But that's, it doesn't Bond in this movie sleep with more women than he has done in any movie so far. Yeah, I think he does. <laughs> so that's All right, funny well, enough. They're all married around the window. There's four women that he sleeps with in this movie. That we, that we, at least we see. So yeah, yeah Kimberly, it's... Uh, Kimberly Mayday. Um, Stacey. Uh, yeah, and uh, Polar. Yeah, so... Yeah, he racks up the record anyway. Interesting yeah. little tidbit. When Stacy checks her computer for the tremor stuff, it's the same sound that's used for when the missiles launch in The Spy Who Loved Me. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I think I've heard that before. So we're getting used to it. Stacy gets fired from her job because Hal is totally in league in some fashion with Zor, and although he's an idiot and he doesn't really know what he's getting into. And we go back to the mansion, and Chuck Lee is like, all right, I'll look into some stuff, and he gets killed. Another backseat of the car type of killing. But I like how they pull that off because they know that Chuck Lee is going to leave. And by the time they go outside, the car is just driving away and there's just music playing. So they don't even think anything of it. But it's, you know, it's not Chuck Lee driving. That's for sure. So He's yeah, dead. It's pretty clever. Yeah, it's really clever. And we've got now a uh, Mayday signature move. Killing the back of a car. Yeah. So big fan of that. That's really cool. Oh, I'm, I'm a big fan of this next scene. So they head to City Hall and they find out where Zorin's oil wells are and the, the main strike, Operation Main Strike that they've been talking about refers to a silver mine along the San Andreas Fault. And then Zorin and Mayday enter, they hold them hostage, they take their guns from them, and they enter Howe's office and Zorin tells him to call the police about a break-in that's happened. And then Zorin does this excellent thing mm. where he like essentially points a gun and says, like, what what's happened, essentially? And he says... Well, what happened is that these two people attempted to, well, they assassinated you and set fire to your office, and then they ended up perishing in a elevator set on fire, or something to that effect. And he says, well, for that to happen, I have to be, and then he says, dead, yes, and just shoots him in the chest. <laughs> yeah. Just, that is so, that is a perfect Bond villain thing to me. Mm-hmm. I, just I love, love that, that moment. moment. Classic. I can't okay, say I. I can't do what the count said. I can't say I love Bond in that leather jacket though. <laughs> no, I, again, I feel like they're just trying to make Bond look younger by putting him in leather jackets and stuff like that. Yeah. But then again, you look at his face and it's like leather as well, so you can't really tell the difference. Well, <laughs> but he's just... matching. <laughs> it's just kind of like, see, he's young. He's he's got the the leather jacket on and the tracksuit, and he's yeah, he's, he's surfing. Jacket, and... Leather mask on as well. It's like... <laughs> 
He's like, I'm listening to what those cool kids are listening to. I wish they all could. They're like, oh, that came out of the 50s <laughs> or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they set fire to the city hall building like the plan is. And we get some more of Stacy being all, James, don't leave me. Now, this is poorly done. He couldn't say, I'm going to climb up and be right back and save you by doing this or whatever. It's it's made worse for her shrieking and just... It if would have been better happen. for her if she would have just shut up and not seemed like a damsel in distress. Because not only would it be less annoying, but then she wouldn't come off as being this like idiot who's just sort of like, please save me, Mario, kind of thing. Like, Okay, so here's the reason why I can kind of, again, the shouting is annoying, but there's a reason why I can kind of defend it. She's just a normal person. Mm-hmm. She has absolutely no instances of being in situations like this. She's not a spy. She's not any sort of trained in any sort of environment like this. She's just a regular human being who's trapped in a flaming elevator shaft. Yeah, I don't disagree with the idea that you shouldn't be scared about it. But for her character to be doing that throughout the film in different moments, it just becomes annoying. And oh, Yeah, I, I, can, I can totally agree with that side of it. I think that it's really poorly written how he says, stay here, and just starts leaving. And she's like, don't leave me. And he eventually is just like, I'm doing something. And it's like, well, tell her, stay here, and I'm going to go do this or whatever. It's safer if you stay here. So like, they could have written a better line for that where she wouldn't have had to be all like, James, don't leave me. Wah! Waving her arms around like, a, what's the, the one with Popeye? I don't like Popeye, so I don't remember. Olive oil. Olive oil, Olive oil yeah. You know, Bluto's the the big dude, right? He sure yeah. is. Yeah. Okay. I was going to call her Bluto, and I'm like, that's not right. <laughs> Popeye saving Bluto here, but he works out how to save her. You know, and we get this triumphant version of the Bond theme, uh, or for the main theme for this film. You know, ba ba da 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 da. When uh, he's carrying her down the fire truck and uh, ladder, and there's a fake out where. He almost falls, and the crowd's like, <gasps> and they all start cheering. And when he doesn't fall, it's really over the top. And the and, drunk drops his drink. Yeah, it's it's not my favorite moment of the movie, that's for sure. But that starts a whole sequence that I'm not 100 percent a fan of. Uh, I do yeah, like portions of it. Thing. This is a bit of a kooky thing. I love the song though. Like uh, Rob was saying earlier, the different variations of the main theme. It's so good. So good. So yeah. good. But again, we have another dumb, fat American cop. Yeah, that's so, what it is. You know, you, the cops in America, complete idiots. And I don't fully disagree with some of that. Was, you know, I mean, I've, I've met some dumb cops before. So, you know, of course you're going to bump into one of them every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, but I like this exchange where... Stacy's like, hey, this guy's a reporter. We can't do this or whatever. And Bond's like, actually, I'm from the British Secret Service. I go, well, is he? And she's like, well, are you? And he's, yeah. Oh, well, I'm Dick Tracy and you're still under arrest. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. I like that a little bit. And Bond steals a fire truck. Yeah, knock him down with a fire hose, first of all. Just like spray a fire hose at him and then steal the fire truck. Yeah, and that's, you know, you got to get the wacky hijinks kind of like that. <laughs> uh, for a portion of this, it's actually Roger Moore driving the truck because they couldn't figure out what to do, really. And he was like, well, I used to drive a truck before. I'll fucking do it. So he doesn't do Damn like right any on. of the action sequences, but he drives the truck for a portion of it. So that's like cool. an old man would. I mean, I, I like it. Yeah. Just like, yeah, in my youth, I was a truck driver for a little bit. I'll drive the fucking truck then, you know? So shout out to Roger Moore for that. And, um... Uh, I wrote down on here, Stacy's a toddler because he, she's all proud when she puts the siren on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just kind of like, can I push the button? <laughs> I did it. I, I pushed I the did button. It. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> so, so for some reason, and again, I don't, I don't really understand what the reasoning was, but Bond shimmies outside of the car, the truck. <laughs> yeah, so to do the action something. scene. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's just the reason, because like, I don't know what... He doesn't say why he's doing it. I don't, and to be fair, when he gets to the thing, like he just sits at another thing, sits at like a controller panel, which seems to be controlling the like part of the truck. Yeah, it's, know. that's just the back of the truck. 
yeah, just, yeah, okay. So he's trying to do that side of it, but then he gets hooked up on because the catch release from the ladder gets knocked off, and he goes flying and he's swinging off there, and we get to see uh, Stacy trying to move him around to try and get him in the right place. And again, yeah. shout out to whoever the guy is that's doing that. It's like the whole like swing me over, not that way, the other way, da 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 kind of thing. Yeah, awful green screen in between that. Yeah, and then we we'll also have some of. Again, one of my favorite worst things in every Bond movie, uh, driving acting. Oh, yeah. The, the fat police cop making his face as fat as possible by just like holding it, like all air puffed into his cheeks while he's driving. They are completely inept, of course. Um, they get, the cops get torn the fuck up. <laughs> It's the whole time Stacy's doing the James, what are you doing? Kind of shtick. And she got nominated, by the way, for a Razzie for worst actress <laughs> for this year. Aww. So I'm not just picking on her just, you know, for myself. She's she's not good. And we get the awesome action theme that I love. The, you know, the da 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 kind of one. Uh there's a sequence where they raise the bridge and Bond and JC uh JC. Uh Stacy jump over it but the cops can't and poor Harris yeah he could just forget about that promotion <laughs> the the cops who fall from the top of this they should be dead right certainly yeah, <laughs> but, but they couldn't yeah. do that right that'd be cruel that would just be really like a downer to be like oh these honest to goodness decent cops they're just dead <laughs> you know but I'm not a fan of a lot of it and it's the whole like, oh jeez, like that car was one uh, day away from retirement kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> commissioner's gonna have my ass for this, that kind of thing. I don't know. Uh, no, they were able to film a lot of this stuff, by the way, because the the mayor, I think it was, or the governor, one of the two, she really liked Roger Moore as Bond. She was like, "That's my favorite Bond. So just do whatever the fuck you want," basically. <laughs> to them so they take over this guy's truck with explosives and stacy changes into that guy's outfit but she's still wearing heels and bond writes it off in this whole sequence by saying it's women's lib they're taking over the teamsters (laughs) we're in the 80s that that's a good line but she changes again right afterward to this damn near skin tight jumpsuit that naturally would never ever be the size of anybody that they would be having working on this job but they lampshade it a bit and it's a an ad lib by roger moore where he says pity you couldn't find one that fits and stacy gives bond a pissed off look afterward and that's apparently tanya roberts real reaction because she was like difficult to work with <laughs> so the director john glenn he kept that line in there basically to spite her (laughs) of just being like this supermodel is here and this makes no fucking sense and this kind of thing so let's just put that in there to be like oh yeah of course you're wearing the thing that's going to show off your body like that or whatever she looks good though (laughs) well these bomb movies sound like one big happy family yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. this was not one of the ones that everybody was like this is the best time i've ever had a lot of other ones people are just like this is the most amazing thing you know the story i told before about like uh, cubby broccoli is cooking pasta for us and this is happening this is great and but every so often you get a movie where some of the people involved just don't get along and that was one of them and it's also a hard hat area, but uh, Mayday's got these thigh high fuck me boots and all because Mayday's got to stand out, you know. So she and Jenny and Panho go after Bond, and Stacy squeaks at every turn. And you know, there's even a part with these rats, and it's like, ew, rats, because, you know, she's a girl. That's basically why they wrote her like that, you know. <laughs> Don't worry, sweetie, Grandpa's here. Yeah, it's, again. <laughs> Not something I'm a big fan of. And she damn near kills herself, too, when she's not looking and she walks into this big fucking hole. (laughs) You know? Well, you know, she's... Defender, Callum. (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, she's not exactly the best here. I'll I'll grant you in that regard. Um, 
I mean, she's trying to figure out where to go in terms of the map and everything like that. And she she's the one that explains to Bond about how the San, San Andreas Fall is going to be flooded and that what, what that will cause, because she's the geologist after all. Yeah. So she does understand that side of it. So she's the one that figures out what things are essentially going to happen. But then she falls down the hole. And essentially it's a running gag for her throughout the movie is that she falls into places and Bond is holding on to her. Mm. Yeah, it happens it, at least four times. <laughs> yeah. And, but yeah, she's recovered and Mayday goes after them, whereas the other two go down a completely different path. And then we get into something that's probably one of the most harrowing things we've seen in the entire Bond film. Yeah. So yeah, Bond uh, is doing his thing with Stacy. Mayday's off trying to deal with everything with Jenny and all that. But Zorin, he doesn't give a shit about all these people dying, including Mayday and company. And he just starts shooting up the place and he's laughing. He's in, he's having a fucking great time, you know? Yeah, yeah. explodes a bomb that um, his second, I can't remember the guy's name. Because, yeah, Scarpine. <laughs> there you go. Told you. I was he like, is. nobody later on is going to be like, remember Scarpine? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I wrote his name once in the entire thing because I was just, I just didn't care. Yeah, he's but, inconsequential. Um, yeah, but like he sets up a bomb in the uh, miner's place and the it blows up and it just starts flooding the entire thing and all the miners are just swept up in a flood and the other two girls are fucked up in the water as it runs over across as well. Um, at one point, uh, Mayday and Bond are caught up in it as well. And yeah, he's just shooting everyone with just this mini Uzi or whatever it was. So it's just, yeah, it's just, it's like I mean, the equivalent, if you've got like a vid- video game reference, is that one from Call of Duty Modern Warfare where just a bunch of guys walk into an airport and just shooting all the place up. Like you get to play as a guy as a, as a one of the crew faking being a a, a Russian uh, military soldier just shooting up all the people in an airport, and that's mm. what it felt like to me. It's just like wow, this is super depressing that this guy, this <laughs> psychopath, is just killing every single person that you can see in the vicinity. Hey, he's just shooting them all up, and he's laughing. He's just like you know, this is this is a fucking great birthday kind of thing. <laughs> like, it would have never happened if they had more cowbell. Yeah, that's the difference maker. See, if Q would have uh, brought some kind of cowbell gadget in here instead of working on Snooper. And he also has another line that has stuck with me in all these years, which is when he tells Scarpine, right on schedule. Just the fact that he said schedule. So, you know, it speaks without I mean, an accent, right? <laughs> and, uh, it's his own accent. And that line always makes me think of another movie, Dracula Dead and Loving It. Because there's this great part in the movie. If anybody hasn't seen it, it's basically it's uh, Leslie Nielsen. So it's the type of like naked gun type of humor, and he's Dracula in the movie, and it's it's good. It's got a lot of uh, funny moments, but there's a good part where um, Renfield is telling these townspeople that he's going to go to uh, to Dracula's castle, and they're like, oh, "You can't do that. That's uh, the Count lives there, and everything." And he's like. I've got a meeting with the count. I have, I, I've got a schedule that I have to take into account or whatever. And people are like, oh, Count Dracula. Oh my God, Count Dracula. And this one dude goes, schedule? <laughs> so, shout out to that movie. But Stacy gets out while Bond and Mayday get swept up in the water. And that's time for Mayday to see how everybody's been killed. And she thought that that creep loved her. She's sad about Jenny. Jenny, no. But she's a beast. She's able to manually crank the rig and both lower Bond and pick him back up with the bomb. And they've got a little bit of an issue with this little hand train kind of thing of, uh, you know, that you would use to, like, put things into the mine. They want to try to get that out. And the hand bra- uh, brake is uh, messed up. So... She gets a redemption by self-sacrifice moment where she volunteers to hold the handbrake and takes the bomb out. Blows up when she's looking at um, Zorin and Zorin's just kind of like, oh, fuck, Mayday brought the bomb out there. I think it's one of the best deaths out of uh, these type of characters. I love it. Yeah, that's an epic death scene. Yeah, uh, Mayday, huge highlight of this film. Um, Epic, epic death. Um, in a different world, I'd like to see her be an ally to Bond. But obviously, we, we would never see that. I would have liked to have seen her have some kind of a mission in the GoldenEye video game, too. Because you got uh, 
Baron Samurai has his own mission. Jaws has his mission. Not one for Mayday or Odd Job. But it's cool she's in it. So You know it's pretty ridiculous though? A little cabin that turns into a blimp. Is you, it though? You know it's even more ridiculous? Really seamless. <laughs> that Stacey isn't able to hear the goddamn blimp coming up from behind her. She's too busy shouting James, so that's kind of like the only yeah. thing she's hearing in her head. They they physically snatch her up. It it's fucking stupid. <laughs> They oh, yeah. they take a blimp and they go up to her and they abduct her. I hate that part. I always laugh at the things that you are just completely put off by because it's you dumb. You know what you're getting. You yeah, you know what you're getting. I mean, I laugh at it, but I'm just like, this is why did they think that this was a good idea? You could have had like that when she got out that they trained a gun on her and said, "Get on the fucking blimp" or something. Instead, they like we're gonna speed up real quick and grab her. <laughs> like it's just so stupid, and that follows with a couple other stupid things too. Bond grabs on the rope, and there's this bit where he his crotch ramps into this antenna, and of course the cops from before are looking at this, and they get into another car accident. It's goofy. I don't like it. But we get a cool fight sequence on top of uh, Golden Gate Bridge. A yeah, great place for a fight. Okay, well that's part of it because he so he he ties up the blimp to the bridge, and that's what stops it in midair. And uh, Zoro makes it go full power, but he can't get it free. <laughs> Another and line then... that stuck with me: more, more power. <laughs> Weird delivery. <laughs> and that's again where Stacy gets involved because she attacks Scorpion Zorin. Well, she attacks Zorin actually. She, she well, yeah, Zorin Scorp- first. And Scorpion, yeah, and Scorpion tries to get out and. Deal with it, and so it means that he's no longer controlling the uh, blimp, and the blimp goes crashing into the side of the bridge. And they go to attack, and like uh, Zorin's going to send Scorpion down to deal with Bond, and she hits him over the back of the head with a fire extinguisher, knocking him out. So it's, she's dealt with two. She's dealt with two of the henchmen herself. It's a repeat of the last film too, where an octopusy Khan tells Gobinda to go out of the plane, and Gobinda's like, "Out there." And this time Zorin's like, "Hey, get out of the blimp!" And he just points like, "Me out there." <laughs> and so then she gets out. Bond gets hold of her. She falls down at one point, so she has to he has to catch her again. Yeah, and keep her from falling off to the side of it. <laughs> James, don't drop have... me. <laughs> and it's pretty. Good. I I feel kind of happy about the fact that, or satisfied at the very least, that. Bond's last, like Roger Moore's last fight scene, and I know obviously it's not all him, there's going to be stunt work being involved here, but the last fight scene of the Roger Moore era of uh, Bond movies is a pretty good one. Yeah, they have this cool fight on the bridge, Zorin's wielding an axe, Stacy at one point is just watching, and uh, I like Zorin's death, how he just starts laughing when he knows he's going to fall, because he's crazy. He's just like, nah, 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 alright, I'm going to die. <laughs> And I, Mortner's upset. I like him. Max, Max. <laughs> he's basically lost his son in a way, so he's gonna get back at them with some fucking dynamite. Why would you have sticks of dynamite inside the blimp? Well, they had explosives in the thing. But why would you keep it in the blimp? <laughs> you know? Why not? Leave that there. This is like a Looney Tunes type of thing too, because Bond cuts one of the cables and they fumble over the TNT, and boom, there goes Mortner and Scarpine. <laughs> yeah. Wiley Coyote would have done better. Would he have, though? Yeah, because at least he would have been able to come back again. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because he would have blo- he would have blown up in the blimp, and he would have just been standing there in midair, all covered in black soot. Yeah. Just hold up a sign saying, help, and then fall down into the water. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Whereas Mortner, just one less Nazi to deal with in the world. Normally, this stuff also goes down in some like remote location, but the fact that this is happening... Like, people are fighting on top of the Golden Great Gate Bridge, and a fucking blimp blew up. There's no, like, ambulances or cop cars. Nobody below is, like, stopped and watching, you know. That'd be, like, a huge incident if that happened. It's, Calif- it's California, baby. It just happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's just, again, uh, filming a movie. <laughs> it's one of my uh, favorite um, uh, exchanges in the whole movie of, uh, Stacy, are you still there? You betcha. <laughs> you betcha. So we're wrapping up the film. What's that? 
No, she just like like you said earlier, she's a little childlike in a way. You know, mm-hmm. you bet. Like she's uh Michelle Tanner from Full House. You betcha, pal. <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, oh no, fairness. that was you got it, dude. That's what it was. <laughs> well, in fairness, she is you know on a mission with Grandpa, so it's okay. Yeah, she puts her thumbs up and uh, everywhere you look. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what? That show takes place in San Francisco. Yeah, Golden Gate Bridge has popped up there, so maybe Michelle was watching it at the time. <laughs> and then afterward, he says, all right, I'll buy you some ice cream, like I did with Bibi. <laughs> and she's like, I want pistachio. Or something. <laughs> uh, just, there's, there's never a cab around when you need need one. Yeah. <laughs> she like thinks it's funny, you know. So he gets a laugh out of her. Grandpa, you're so funny. Yeah. Instead of those instances where Bond makes a joke to himself. Or like in For Your Eyes Only, where he's like, don't talk unless you need to. By the way, I got a funny joke. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But Gogol's back again. He wants to give Bond the Order of Lenin Award. It's the first time that anybody is uh, awarded that that's not a Soviet citizen. And he, he yucks it up with the defense minister. M is like, uh, I'm surprised. Uh, I would have thought you would have been happy to see Silicon Valley destroyed. And Gogol says... Oh, on the contrary, where would Russian research be without it? And both Google and the defense minister are like, ha, 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 that's right, you're stealing. And still like, <laughs> we're just doing these wacky uh, spy games. Yeah, <laughs> fucking, you know, Anatoly. <laughs> I love Google. I'm glad that he pops he's up good. in another movie. He is good. And Money Penny's all sad. She thinks that Bond is dead because he's missing. So. They need to continue their search, and Q, mind you, is outside of Stacy's mansion, and he uses the snooper robot to go into the room and sees that Bond's showering with Stacy. So we get a return of the end of the film with a joke about Bond fucking the girl comedy bit, because it's like, oh, you know, Bond's alive. Well, what's he doing? He's just cleaning up a few details. Not the best one. And it ends, of course, with a, oh, James, you know. And that's uh, kind of the end. Because the end of more. The one note that I didn't even realize um, that I had uh, came across on the trivia thing. It was like, yeah, Bond's uh, last or Roger Moore's last thing is throwing in the towel. So it's like that's kind of neat. That's awesome, actually. So at this point, Roger Moore's Bond has slept with a total of seventeen women which is only one more than Connery's Bond, so he wins. And he also has more on-screen kills than Connery. Mostly because he's he's done two more movies, but... Moore has the most on-screen kills of any Bond. Well, I think that uh, Brosnan takes that into a... Really? Because Brosnan kills a lot of people. I I just had watched a video on it not that long ago. Uh, Same night I sent you the stuff about... uh, Shimon Defer. Moore huh. has the most kills. Wow. But this is definitely the end of an era. I mean, we see Roger Moore is leaving. Lois Maxwell's Money Penny is gone. She's the only person that had been in all the movies at that point. The stuntman that was in all the movies beforehand, Bob Simmons, he's gone. No more Bob Simmons anymore. Mm. No more hat scene. Uh, no more hats. Yeah, I I, do, I think that the only other time in the entire series where Bond wears a hat, at least the only one I can remember, is one, like, 20-second shot in Tomorrow Never Dies where he's wearing, like, his naval outfit. I don't think that he wears a hat any other time. So that's kind of weird to think that, like, we're 14 movies in here. That's been a, one of these little staple trademark moments. And then a whole 10 movies later, just like, nope. No more. But things change over time, you know. He'll eventually use a different gun and different things. And um That's yeah, that's that's the movie. Damn. <laughs> Pretty it's kind of a big moment, you know? It really is the end of an era. They all feel so different, pretty much this point going forward. The next movie it it feels like it's transitioning between A V to Kill and License to Kill, but yeah, it's going to be... I mean, they advertise Timothy Dalton as 
the uh the most violent bond ever you know in the next things and stuff so if you're a fan of like the the more comedic roger moore type of thing and you're going into these next films you know if you grew up with this that's probably the point where you're like oh bond's not bond anymore you know blood and yeah. guts all over the place <laughs> i i always recall when brosnan changed to craig and it just he's not bond so let's go back let's talk about our pros and cons of these different elements that we've done in the past on the gadgets side of things we got the polarizing sunglasses <laughs> thumbs down uh, yeah. camera ring the checkbook ultraviolet light thing we got the electric shaver that's the bug detector the credit card lock pick we got snooper uh, I don't know so I'm gonna say ultimately thumbs down down only because it's the 80s you think they would have gotten a little more innovative with what they could do yeah it's, i'd say overall down they didn't none of them really seem not stand out to me in the long term yeah like the iceberg ship is kind of neat and i like the credit card lock pick that's pretty something like that you know they're pretty decent to use on a regular basis but the sunglasses in particular, I just really don't like. On the allies side of things, we've got Money Penny and M and Q and Sir Frederick Gray and General Golgol and Chuck and Sir Godfrey Tibbet. They're a thumbs up, though. I'd say so. Um, yeah, I think they were. They had a good amount of personality to them. Mostly Tibbet. Yeah, Tibbet was the better one. Yeah, much better than Chuckley. Yeah, I don't think Chuckley needs to. I mean, they needed like one more sacrificial lamb, I guess, but that's basically all he was. And yeah. on the music side of things, uh, the the best fucking thing in the movie. <laughs> we got a view to a kill. We've got the action theme, the triumphant horn version of the main theme. We got uh, <laughs> Tchaikovsky. We got the uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons pops up. We got California Girls, unfortunately, but this is overwhelmingly uh, a huge thumbs up because of, you know, like a beautiful kill on its own. Huge thumbs up, especially the score though, too. And look, California girls is stupid. It doesn't fit, but even then it's a great song. Still thumbs all the way up. Yeah, definitely thumbs up for the, uh, the music for the movie. On the villains, we've got Max Zorin, we've got Mayday, Dr. Carl Mortner, Scarpine, Pan Ho, Jenny Flex. Thumbs up. There's some Thumbs that up. really are like Scorpi uh, Scarpine, nobody's ever going to bring up, but, you know, Zorin and Mayday are great. Zorin, I haven't decided where yet, but he's near the top for me right now. A lot of fun, and Mayday is a top-notch henchman right up there with Odd uh, Job and Jaws. Yeah, I think that both of them are two super stand out in both the categories. I currently have Zorin ranked as my third villain, third best villain there. Yeah, it's right about where he's going to land for me. I still think Scaramanga is best, but it's either going to be Zorin number two or number three. Yeah, I uh I'm ranking him lower than you guys are, but not by too much more. He's uh one, two, three, four, five, number six for me. Behind the two of the Blofelds, Scaramanga, Rosa Club, and Goldfinger. So he's just above Dr. Kananga for me. Yeah, I'll put him above Goldfinger. I'm gonna put him at number two. And then on like the henchman scale, I've got Mayday. She's still below Fiona, Odd Job, Jaws from the Spy Who Loved Me, and Red Grant, but she's my number five. She's just above Nick Knack and way above Paddy Whack. Um, <laughs> and she definitely gave a few dogs a few bones. Yeah, that's true. Cor uh, Carl Mortner and Scarpine and whatever, like they're they're lower on that list, and I didn't even bother ranking like a Panho and 
Jenny Flex. But on the girl side of things, though. Jenny Flex. So thumbs up on the uh, pantheon of names. <laughs> yeah, Jenny Flex. Uh, she's hot. Paula Ivanova's hot. Uh, you know, if we're talking about good looking women, I mean, there's a lot of good looking women in this. If we're talking character wise, not a whole lot of them rank super high to me. The highest out of the bunch is easily Money Penny. Uh, Money Penny. Why do I keep wanting to call her Money Penny? Easily. I think you're uh, not wanting to let go of the character, or <laughs> at least the actress. Maybe that's it. You know, I'm just used to saying Money Penny more often, but. Mayday is definitely the highest on the list. I rank them in the order of Mayday and then Paula Ivanova and then Stacy. And then it's basically like, well, Kimberly and Jenny are the same. And Panho is uh, Panho is actually my lowest ranked out of everybody right now. She's actually lower than Bambi and Thumper. I don't know why. I don't know. I liked Bambi and Thumper. I can't necessarily say that they stand out as these low points. Your turn, Bambi. <laughs> when you start doing that weird fucking dance that Thumper's doing, I mean, come on. Nobody solves it in the gypsy way either. Well, that's disappointing. But what are you thinking? Thumbs up, thumbs down when it comes to the Bond girls? Uh, thumbs up. Yeah, most. Yeah, I'd say mostly thumbs up. They're never really going to be a full on thumbs down. Uh, maybe. Maybe, maybe not from maybe not from maybe not from this point, but um but yeah, I'd say if I was to rank them these four in particular, it'd be Mayday is definitely the top one. And then I'd go Stacy and then Polar and Kimberly, I think are pretty neck and neck because Polar's pretty dumb. I mean Stacy's pretty dumb as well, but Polar her <laughs> only her only her only thing in the whole movie is to lose the one thing that she was assigned to get. Yeah. Uh, so I have to know if I if like it's just me, but when that Tchaikovsky line hits you, Callum, do you stop everything you're doing and just go, what the fuck am I watching? Or are you just numb to it at this point? I I, I, I could see. I mean, I don't say like I saw it coming or anything like that, but just like, okay, that doesn't that doesn't strike me too much because it's, it's very much a trope of British comedy where you're trying to maintain a certain level of things where, because basically saying like, oh, the bubble's going to my, and you know what she's going to say, and then she just says a random word. That's basically that's completely out of context with what she was saying beforehand. That's very much like a staple of British humour. So ah. it, it, it doesn't uh, phase me in that regard. It's funny, but it doesn't phase me. It's not like I would see, a, see that happen and go, oh my God, like, what the fuck is going on? It's like, I've, I've watched this for tons of years in comedy movies. and So. That's fair. It would have been a lot more jarring if she would have said, the bubbles tickle my pussy galore. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps more accurate. Uh, we don't get anything like as direct as that in the series. At one point in one movie, one character says fuck. And it's like the most understated thing in the world. One character just goes, I really fucked this up, didn't I? And it's like, oh. they just said fuck. Like, it's not, like in the movie theater, that was one of those moments where I'm like, somebody said fuck in a Bond movie. What the fuck? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But. The bubbles tickle my Tchaikovsky. <laughs> when I had first seen that, God knows how many years ago at this point, 15, 20 years ago, I was just sort of like, all right, makes sense. <laughs> on the uh, the action and the humor, I think thumbs up on both. Even though the action... Uh, you know what? No. Maybe I would go thumbs down on the action, actually. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, because there's not a single scene that you don't know that's not Roger Moore. The humor definitely is the thumbs up. But we, when we got one of the deaths is somebody gets killed by a fake butterfly, then yeah, I think I might have to go <laughs> thumbs down on the action part. But some of the action's very good. Like Kelly Calm said, the final fight scene's great. Mayday's scenes were great. Ah, I'll say thumbs up. Uh, I've got that thumbs down on the action side of it, even though some of it is is very good. Just a few of them, like the the death by the butterfly, the the overall car chases in general, the fighting with the boxes, there's and the fight with the vase and stuff like that. There's too many bad ones to overstate the the good ones. And I guess saying it about the humor side, oh, it's very funny. It's, oh, a, it's a funny movie. Oh, fantastic. 
So then that rounds us out with, uh, is it shaken? Not stirred? It's it's definitely shaken. Yeah, it's, it's, it's shaken for me. Mm, shaken for me, too. It's in that mid-range. It's just, uh, it's one of those movies that it's not fundamentally a great movie. I can never advertise it as being some Oscar nominee, but it's one of the movies I can easily watch because it's just fun. It's kind of like The Man with the Golden Gun is a movie that a lot of people dislike, and I love it. And if I'm going to watch a Bond film, If You Do a Kill is not going to be one of my five go-to options, but it's going to be in that range. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to watch a video kill than to watch, say you only live twice or the spy who loved me or Dr. No or whatever. Again, all of the movies I like to a certain extent. So even the lowest rank that I have diamonds are forever is like a goofy fucking romp that I like watching every once in a while. Dr. No is the hardest for me to actually sit and watch, but a video kill it's an easy watch for me. It's just weird and funny and dumb. And I'm a fan. You yeah. just swapped uh, something around on your list, Callum. I'm a- Did you? I thought they, I thought I saw you swapping something around. Uh, but no, you just clicked uh, on no. it and said, I had swapped. Uh, I put Max Oren at the top of the villain list, but that was it. Ah, no, you say uh, the top, top. No, I put him uh, under under Scott Scott Ranger, but he's pretty near the top. Uh, also, prior to recording for a little while, I had a view a view to a kill over Goldfinger, but then I just them back around. Hmm. So it ranks in that middle range, which is that's pretty good, you know. Fourteen movies for it to be in that six or seven range. Thumbs mm-hmm. up on that. And that Very means good. that we're going to be taken into my f- favorite three film stretch. Because the next one's one of my favorites. And then we have my number two favorite of all the movies. And then my number one favorite of all the movies. (laughs) So I'm excited about that. Because this is going to be a lot of me being like, how fucking cool is this? And how good is this? And how great is that? Yeah, Cam, you're going to have to block off some time in your schedule for GoldenEye. (laughs) It might be. GoldenEye in particular is going to be like, here's the special juggernaut edition of this. Where I'll just be like, the sound effect in this part. And the, the set decoration in this part or whatever. I currently have it planned that I'm going to probably watch GoldenEye seven times that week because I have I have commentary <laughs> tracks lined up of like Famke Janssen did a, a watch along earlier this year that I saved ahead of time of like I'll sync that up and watch that when we start doing the GoldenEye thing so and I could probably quote the entire film off the top of my head so <laughs> that much of an impress well was it your first like your first new one? It might have been the first Bond film I actually watched. Yeah, that would explain it. Yeah, there's a whole generation of people that for that movie, that's what it is. So, I mean, it's weird to think that with each of these movies, it's probably the first one that somebody has watched. Like uh, Calvin Dyson, um, who has a YouTube channel that's great. I think the first movie that he had watched was Moonraker. So that's always stuck with him as being like one of his favorites and... Golden Eye is just objectively one of the best. So, but we'll get that in two more movies down the line. Um, let's round things out here with uh, some other plugs that we've got. As I mentioned before, make sure you show your support by donating to the Patreon, patreon.com slash fanboys anonymous. And there's the join button on YouTube and the like button and the share button and the follows and the different ways that you can just kind of show like physically show that you are supporting this series and you can check out the other stuff that we have up on here. I'm not entirely sure exactly when this is going to air. We've been airing them. We recorded them a a way in advance. This is April 3rd when we're recording this. So I think it actually might be May something. It's either April 30th or May 7th. It's most likely when this is going to air. So by this point we'll be done with WrestleMania coverage and hopefully next week when we get into the living daylights, we're going to um, not be like super out of it and everything, but that stuff, if you want to go back and check out the pro wrestling stuff, it's over on smartoutmoment.com. And I've got, of course, lots of different things planned for fanboys anonymous that are outside of the James Bond series that at this point we'll have done some kind of a thing based off of probably a fan tracks of the mortal Kombat film 
The other day from when we were recording this, we did the Godzilla vs. Kong fan track, so go back and check that out if you're interested. And there's going to be other things as well in the pipeline. Uh, Mount Rushmore of Bond villains, is some uh, of uh, Batman villains is what we're doing tomorrow when we're recording this. And God knows what else. I know at some point we're going to do another Pokemon thing. So if you're into Pokemon, we'll see more battling and whatever. But you know, if you go to the Fanboys Anonymous site and you click around, you'll see lots of different things going on. And hopefully you'll enjoy them just as much, if not more, than what you're enjoying here. These guys have other things well, that you can no be checking more. out. No more? There's no yeah, more there's no more. <laughs> no more. Uh, but yeah, since I started talking, I will just say, follow me on Twitter at Dude Felice. Check out everything I'm doing over at Fightful.com. If you are interested in the pro wrestling side of things, check out what I'm doing over at WrestleZone.com. And keep your eyes peeled to smart out moment to see what else we've got going on all the great articles and whatever is coming next from myself and cal miggins yeah still no huge plans in the pipeline as of right now or at least nothing that i can reveal on any other podcast platforms but do check out smartcatmoment.com all the articles that are there on a regular basis including the power rankings my usual contribution uh, then you can also check out in the archives of the YouTube channel Smart Cat Mom- on Smart Cat Moment uh, our retro series 2001 A Wrestling Odyssey and the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast. So if you're a big fan of wrestling from between the years of like 2001 to 2003, those are two uh, podcast series that you should definitely be checking out. Uh, other than that, follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. You can follow me at Tony Mango and at A Mango Tree and reach out. Let me know what you got that you're interested in. If you got any merchandise uh, design ideas you want me to do and put up on TeePublic and Redbubble, or if you want us to add to the list of some of the things that we'll do once we're done wrapping up the Bond franchise and we're getting into the extraneous stuff. If you have any ideas, then let us know about that as well. And generally speaking, just keep staying tuned because James Bond and the Review to a Kill podcast will return with Ah, the living daylights. 